Anne Hawthorne presents A Novelist and an Earl, a Regency Romance by Anne Hawthorne, performed by Mary Jane Wells. Chapter One Don't be silly, Belinda. He is not going to come. Isabella Rivers turned away from her younger sister and glanced out the window. The view from their room in the Blackwood Hotel opened onto the heavy grey sky above and the world of heavy grey stones below. How do you know? Belinda was persistent. It would make sense for his lordship to want to surprise his intended before they arrange the ceremony. I am sure it would, if he were a character of a chivalric romance or a particularly silly modern novel. As far as I know, he is neither. Such things have happened in real life, Belinda countered. I have read my histories, too, you know. In the days of the 8th Henry, King James of Scotland surprised his bride Margaret by galloping to meet her in the guise of a simple minstrel, his lute slung over his crimson doublet. I wonder if anyone was taken in by this. Minstrels usually could not afford crimson doublets. That was not the point, and you well know it. You cannot deny there is something quite romantic about the notion. It was a royal match. Perhaps he simply wanted to make a good impression on the diplomats as much as on the lady. Besides, kings are prone to doing peculiar things. They always were. Thankfully, I am not marrying one. No, you are marrying a simple earl, Belinda teased her. I'm not complaining. You never do. I cannot quite believe you have not a romantic bone in your body, Isabella. I have read your novels, after all. They are quite full of dramatic happenstance and lovers reunited. And also of murders, poisonings and family secrets. I shudder to think what you surmised about my character from that part. Well, that was quite thrilling to read, too. That was the point. Of all of it, both the poisonings and the lovers, I write what the public finds thrilling to read, sister. It has nothing to do with some secret yearnings of mine. Are you going to... Abandon your inkwell now? What? I mean, now that you will be the Countess of Arth, I imagine you're going to be busy. Besides, even if you will have free time, I'm not sure your husband will suffer seeing his wife's name appear in print. He would not have to, for that matter. I have a pen name, remember? For the reading public, I am Signora Fiumi. Isabella preferred not to think too long or too hard, about just how much of the role the Italianate pen name played in her success. After the Renaissance set dramatic novels of Anne Radcliffe, the public was hungry for the stories of Italian castles, and Isabella judged that, if she had to hide her name to avoid embarrassing her parents anyway, it might as well be something that would help her sales. Besides, we have no reason to suppose that he adheres to Pericles' views on virtuous womanhood, father can hardly be called a radical of William Godwin's frame, but he allowed me to continue under an assumed name. Perhaps his lordship is going to be just as sensible. There was a scent of rain blowing in from the open window, the smell of grey water on ancient stones. Somewhere in the distance, Isabella could hear hammering. From what she had heard at dinner, there were a lot of new buildings being erected in Edinburgh, the town slowly blossoming into prosperity like a once-forgotten flower. Still, Belinda insisted, I think it's rather cold of his lordship not to meet you here, instead to simply wait for you to come to his estate. He knows you've never been that far north before, after all. If I were a gentleman, I would have done my utmost to soothe my future wife and tend to her comfort. What a thoughtful suitor you would have made for someone, Isabella joked. Alas, my future husband has little reason to do the same. He has seen me the whole of three times, and then rather briefly. That is not quite enough for this sort of tenderness to grow. Are you not sad about marrying someone who feels no tenderness for you? I've always known it was going to be something like this. Isabella shrugged. Besides, that doesn't mean he is going to never feel any affection for me in the future. One can find sweet contentment in marriage without any romantic gestures or dramatic adventures involved. Indeed, most people do. Are you quite sure? You are nineteen. Sometimes you speak like a matron of forty years behind her at the very least, and one who has led a very sorrowful life. I am quite sure of my age, Isabella replied, perhaps more primly than was strictly needed. 
but I know my duty. There is no possibility that I can ever evade it. There never was any possibility, so why engage in idle dreams? Better to sow something fine out of the material one has been given. Still, she could not quite resist another look outside, where far below the busy thoroughfare of the Prince's Street lay. She did not expect George Trevelyan, the Earl of Earth, to appear galloping down it at any moment. But as Belinda could not hear her thoughts, she could admit to herself that she would not have been opposed to the sight. Would you like me to ask the kitchen to prepare something for the journey, your lordship? George Trevelyan, the Earl of Earth, turned around sharply. His old housekeeper was standing on the threshold that separated the foyer from the rooms beyond. Comfortable, although Castle Earth now was, it lacked the sweeping staircases of the country houses of the south. What do you mean, Mrs. Mackenzie? Why, only that you're going to be hungry on your journey to Edinburgh, unless you only intend to eat at the inns, the expense. George sighed with fond exasperation. The old housekeeper had once been a nursemaid to his father, and when the late Earl grew up, she had remained with the family. He almost said, until the bitter end. But he was going to do his utmost to ensure that the bitter end in question would never arrive. I am not going to Edinburgh. Indeed, I had no such intention. Why would I? Because your wife-to-be is currently there. But she's going to arrive here soon enough. What would be the point of intercepting her on the journey? I'm sure the lady would appreciate it, Mrs Mackenzie said, as tactfully as she possibly could. She did not strike me as a woman fond of spur-of-the-moment extravagance. To be fair, there were not that many occasions when Isabella Rivers had the chance to strike him as anything. His stay in London had been relatively brief, and did not even last the full season. His search was for a woman of good upbringing and good sense, not of a Grecian goddess in flesh, as some young men tended to seek. Marrying well was his duty. Giving the estate a good mistress was his need. He was very glad when he found out that Viscount Rivers had two daughters and that the eldest one was already out. During the few evenings George had spent in the family's townhouse, the Viscount spoke more than his daughter ever did. George could remember her well, standing with her eyes downcast or sitting with knitting in her lap. He remembered being struck by this small detail, that she occupied her hours with making something warm and useful, not with seemingly impressive but mostly ornamental accomplishments that so many mothers pushed their daughters to develop. She had very fine grey eyes, too. He had felt their full impact only once, when, during a suitably chaperoned conversation in their parlour, she had abandoned her slightly too modest, slightly sideways look and gazed at his face with new frankness. In the corner of his eye, George could see her mother glaring at her, probably perceiving her staring as unladylike. Nothing could be further, then, from thoughts in George's own head, however. That morning he was talking about... What on earth was he talking about? Something about his own late mother. Something about the summers when she took the boys to see the place where one of their Norse ancestors fell. For the late Countess of Earth had been as proud of her long-diluted Viking blood as though the longships had arrived on these shores a mere year ago. George was not sure any of that would be of interest to a young woman, but evidently he was wrong. The Honourable Miss Isabella Rivers was all intention, and in that moment he discovered that her eyes were not pure grey, but had blue flecks around the iris. All nonsense, of course. No man of sense would base his decision on whether or not to marry a woman on such things. No more did he. When he proposed, he took into account their respective lineages, upbringings, and financial situations. He did not think about her eyes. He was certainly not thinking about them now, and he most surely was not going to go on a three-day journey south only to see them sooner than was planned. As though hearing his thoughts, the old housekeeper tut-tutted. She is a young lady, your lordship. She has never been here before. She probably has some notions of how a man of courtesy should behave. Some hopes. In that case, it would be better if I disabused her of such notions as soon as possible. 
I have no intention of mistreating her, of course. God knows I've never been cruel to a woman, and never will be. But what mercy would there be in letting her believe I'm some hero from a novel? The late Earl would have done so? My father, you mean? No, your lordship. Your brother. She was right. Andrew would have probably done so indeed. He would have been off to intercept her in Edinburgh in a dash. He would have probably brought gifts too, and entertained her whole family at dinner, his warm smile seemingly made to put maidens at ease. Andrew would have done that and many things besides. But George was not his brother. Indeed, he had no intention at all of becoming more like his brother. If going south for a pointless gesture was one step in that direction, that only made him less willing to take it. I am not him, Mrs Mackenzie, George said, his voice lower. He liked the housekeeper and knew that she always had the well-being of the family in mind. But just because she remembered when the estate still sported bare rafters overhead and an open chimney in the patched-on kitchen of black turf, that did not mean she had a license to direct his conduct. Now, if you will excuse me, I have business to attend to. Where are you going to? The housekeeper dropped the topic. She knew when he was not to be budged. She probably also knew what kind of business he was referring to. To the lake, George replied, and strode out. They both knew what lake it was. Neither needed to name the loch deep within the acres of his lands by name. Neither did they need to discuss his purpose. Chapter 2 Naturally, the bans had been read according to all the rules. Of course, both families could have simply obtained a special licence from the local bishop, but neither party wanted to risk causing rumours that the wedding might have needed to be hastened along. Isabella privately agreed with this decision. Belinda, dressed now in white as Isabella herself was, had once mentioned the summer wedding to be a wondrous thing, since the walk to and from the church was likely to be a delightful thing. In doing so, however, she did not count on the fact that the Highland summer was not quite the same as its equivalent in the home counties. As a result, both the bride and the bridesmaid were now shivering in their pale satin, and Isabella in particular tried to walk faster, hoping to reach the destination quicker. She did not get far. Her mother's hand clasped her elbow, gently but firmly. Walk with dignity, Lady Rivers whispered. You are not a scullery maid running errands. You are a noble bride on her way to the church. At this moment, a gust of cold wind ruffled some of the red strands of Isabella's hair, peeking from beneath the bonnet. However, she had no choice but to nod. So, nod she did. Her opinion on the great change that was supposed to transform her, the change that was to take place in the church in question, was curiously as numb as her hands were now. A well-arranged wedding was simply something that happened to girls of her birth. It was as natural as the death of flowers in December, and just as inevitable. The church was decorated sparsely. It was a stern thing, born out of the crucible of the Reformation, built of grey stone and wood, and stretching out in the likeness of a sharp letter T. On the occasion of the wedding, it was drowning in white lilies, as though in sea foam. But curiously, the flowers did little to soften the interior. Isabella walked slowly down the aisle, trying not to turn her head this way and that way too curiously, too much. However, even with a mere glance out of the corner of her eye, she could see that the guests from the bridegroom's side were rather few and far between. Which was understandable, she supposed. After all, with his parents and brother both dead, the Earl of Eth could not gather as formidable a family party as the Rivers did. She could glimpse the small group, a married couple in their middle years and several neatly dressed children, who had been before described to her as the Grants of Rothi Mercas. Well, she supposed it was a good thing her husband-to-be had good friends. After all, her own would all remain south of the border, and she would have to make do with his. The Earl was standing and waiting for her, his spine as straight as a blade. His features were not unlike something chiselled out of stone, if by a skilled craftsman. This thought came to Isabella months before, during their very first meeting, and nothing had happened to change this opinion of hers. 
Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony. The parson began when Isabella was standing by her bridegroom's side. She tried to smile encouragingly at the man she was now marrying, but he did not respond. Then she realized he could have hardly seen her expression through the veil, however fine its lace, and silently castigated herself for foolishness. Then followed the part of the speech whose meaning had been explained to Isabella by her mother before the journey north, the one about the meaning of marriage being a remedy against sin and to avoid fornication. Therefore, if any man can show any just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter forever hold his peace. Several moments passed in solemn silence. For a second, for a wild second, Isabella was seized by the flight of fancy that she had usually reserved only for her heroines, and wished the doors of the church would fly open, and some young man would proclaim that this wedding cannot take place, for the earl was rightly married to his sister. Then she could climb back into the carriage, even without changing her clothes into something more sensible, and suffer nothing greater than the indignity of a hasty journey back to the home of her childhood, back into girlhood, back into the South. But of course, nothing of the sort happened, for life was not a novel. The parson asked the couple whether they themselves knew of any impediment to the marriage, and naturally both shook their heads. "'George, Peter Trevelyan, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife, "'to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? "'Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honour, and keep her in sickness and in health, "'and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live?' "'I will,' the dark-haired man answered evenly. Isabella Catherine Rivers, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honour, and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? Here it came, obey and serve. Not that Isabella had been unaware of this part of the oath, but it was one thing to know it vaguely and another to hear it under the solemn auspices of a church. You are shivering, her bridegroom murmured, looking directly at her for the first time since she crossed this threshold. Isabella nodded barely perceptibly. Her palms were cold with sweat. I will give you a good shawl for the wedding breakfast, he promised, his voice just as low, just as well they were currently in the fiery centre of a dozen glances. With these words, Isabella felt just a fraction warmer, as though the shore was already embracing her shuddering shoulders. She turned to the parson again, and proclaimed, loud enough for all the guests to hear, I will. Isabella was waiting, sitting on the edge of her new bed, her face clean, in her nightgown, her hair unbound just as her mother had instructed her to be when it came to the first night after the wedding. It did not take her long to hear footsteps in the corridor. A shiver ran down her spine. She knew the duty, but that did not mean she had to relish it. By the expression on her new husband's face, he did not exactly relish the prospect either. He paused on the threshold, looking at her with such eyes as though he were seeing her for the very first time in his life. Isabella sat still, partly because she did not wish to appear too eager, partly because she genuinely was not. She knew, if vaguely, what was going to happen now. He was going to come closer to her. He was going to kiss her. Now, this part was not quite frightening. His lips on hers that she could imagine, even though she was not sure how she would respond. She imagined that they would be firm, perhaps even harsh. My lady, George Trevelyan spoke. I'm sorry for what I'm about to do. It was strange, although his courtesy was as pleasant as it was startling. You do not need to apologise, Isabella told him. 
and even forced a smile upon her lips. I do. One should not leave a bride alone on the wedding night. My wait was not that long. And you are here now? I'm sorry. I think you do not understand, he interrupted her. I have to go now. She looked at him, stunned. Are you... And well, my lord? It was the most delicate way she could put the question of whether he had overindulged in drink during the celebrations. That would not be particularly surprising and definitely would not be something unforgivable. Sheltered though she was, Isabella could not remain ignorant of the ways of men too long. She knew that when her father dined with his old friends at his club, or even in their home sometimes, the quantities of port and Madeira flowing there were more akin to rivers than to rivulets. But her husband shook his head. I'm perfectly sober, if that is what you mean. His tone was rather gruff at this, but his eyes were clear and his back straight. It is only that there is some unforeseen business. Some visitor? I suppose one can put it this way. For a second he looked incredibly tired, as tired as his bride was. But the vision did not last long. In a moment, George Trevelyan, the Earl of Earth, regained his control over himself and became the slightly gloomy bastion of self-possession that he was before. What was she to do? On one hand, it was her duty to make the marriage true. On the other, arguing with her husband when he had clearly had weighty reasons for leaving her alone did not seem like a good course of action. And there was another reason. Underneath it all, Isabella was secretly relieved that what was to happen inevitably was going to happen at least with her well rested and ready, not after a parade of exhausting days that culminated in an even more exhausting ceremony. But it was not why she was agreeing, Isabella told herself. It could not be. She was not some irresponsible chit. Of course, she nodded. I understand. Thank you. He inclined his head. The Earl stepped out of the bedroom. But before the darkened corridor swallowed his figure, he looked back, and Isabella saw some reluctance to leave in his eyes. One would have thought she would sleep like a babe now, but Isabella could not find a way into the kingdom of Morpheus, however she tried. The thin crescent moon was high in the sky, and still she was awake. When she heard some noise from outside, it was almost an invitation. Immediately, Isabella climbed out of her bed and then stepped closer to the window. The draughts assaulted her with an unfamiliar, bracing cold. It looks like I will have to have warmer nightgowns made, warmer clothes in general. Looking out onto the vast lands of the Earth estate, Isabella did not immediately understand what was happening there. She saw a dark procession winding its way through the fields, some members of it already disappearing into the forest. She narrowed her eyes to make out the shape of what they were carrying and realised it could not have been anything else but a coffin. She was not a superstitious woman, but it was harder to imagine a worse omen on the day of her wedding. A death in one of the nearby villages could be explained by myriad rational reasons, but it was downright uncanny that this funeral cortege was to depart this very day. Except it did not depart this very day, it departed this very night. What sort of entombment was that? Did it have to do with some peculiar local belief, something pertaining to this small region? The novelist in her never fully asleep, she started imagining the person so born. Was it some old woman who still remembered maidens playing airs about the Bonnie Prince Charlie? Was it some strong young lad who suffered an accident? She did not particularly believe it was a miserable lover who drowned herself in the nearby river out of unrequited passion. She was not such a ninny hammer to believe that people who had to work land for a living could be so fragile as that. However, she decided it would not be a bad feature in some new novel of hers. With that thought, she went back to bed. Chapter 3 If this was not the most uncomfortable breakfast ever endured by a newlywed couple, it was certainly one of the leading contenders for the title, Isabella could not help but think. 
The dining room was clearly a newfangled thing, freshly upholstered. None of the medieval air of dark wood and stone that suffused the river's own country estate seemed to hang about it. This was the room belonging to a family newly on the make, even if their title was ancient. The portraits hanging on the walls were by the bright and fluid brash of Rayburn, with no farthingale staidness about them. The one hanging right in Isabella's line of sight was a grand family portrait, a handsome couple and their two dark-haired boys. It was not hard to recognise her husband in the younger of the two. Even in the uniform serenity of the portrait, the unsmiling curve of his lips and the sullenness in his eyes betrayed him. The other child, tall and smiling, must have been his late brother, the late Earl Andrew Trevelyan. Isabella shifted her gaze to the man of flesh and blood sitting opposite her. There were shadows under his eyes. Had whatever business that tore him away from her devoured most of his night? I wonder, Isabella started, I wonder if there had been a death in the village. Her husband stared at her with sharpness utterly unwarranted by the question. What do you mean, my lady? It is only that I saw a funeral cortege yesterday. For all his stares, this was the easier question to ask, far easier than inquiring on whether he intended to remedy yesterday's lapse soon. She did not want to seem impatient, too shrewish, or worse, shameless. Not to my knowledge, but then I am not all-seeing. He did not claim that he had no interest in the goings-on among the farmers, it occurred to Isabella, merely that he did not know all about these goings-on. That spoke well of him. It was in the middle of the night, she noted. That must have been a strange funeral indeed. It must have been, George Trevelyan replied almost neutrally. His grey eyes were impassive and implacable. She had no choice but to give up, even if the irritation in the heart was harder to smother. Her question was not a particularly difficult one, after all. The peculiarity of what happened was self-evident. It would not have taken him much time to explain the matter, would it? I wonder, Isabella started again, if your cook would mind making hot chocolate for breakfast from time to time? Are you accustomed to that, my lady? I am not a woman of many sensual indulgences, but I confess... Hot chocolate is one of those delights I could never wean myself from. It might be better to talk to Mrs. Mackenzie about it. Uh, she was the usual liaison between my mother and the kitchen, as far as I can recall. So you would not mind? Why would I mind? It is not a great expense. That was not necessarily the matter of expense, Isabella thought. Quite a number of men would have taken the occasion to school their over-tender, London-bred new wife in humility. And if she could not get the answers to her questions, if she could not be made a proper wife in more ways than one, she could at least get her cup of hot chocolate in the mornings. The town was not that far from the castle and the surrounding lands, but that was not why George decided to dispense with the carriage and go instead on horseback. It was not his habit to be more conspicuous than strictly needed, especially in matters like these. A new thought entered his head, intruding upon the serene underwater peace that always enveloped him when he was on horseback upon a well-known road. It was not so much a matter of keeping his identity and dealings secret from the people there now as hiding these from the lady at home. Of course, he claimed a visit to his lawyer as the excuse when mentioning his future absence to Isabella at breakfast, but she was hardly a fool and if she did not ask, why on earth would an earl travel for several hours to come to his lawyer instead of it being the other way around? He suspected it was simply out of politeness. Politeness or fear? He dearly hoped it was not the latter. He did not feel any great passion for his new wife, but he certainly did not want her to be afraid of him. Well, you did not exactly work in that direction splendidly, did you? His inner voice whispered. His inner voice sounded suspiciously like Mrs. Mackenzie. His inner voice was also right. He was not at his best dealing with other human beings, but even he was aware that abandoning a new bride on her wedding night was not exactly a done thing. But he could not have helped it. Some matters are too grave to be neglected and too urgent to be postponed. Too grave? 
George could not help but wince at this unintended pun of his. His destination was known to him, and the route to it well trodden. He left his horse to be cared for at a decent inn upon approaching the town, and walked the pitiful distance at the place this size required him to walk. He recalled his father's tales of the state of the town as it was during the older man's own childhood. If there ever was a place that, as some conquerors of old claimed, a maiden could walk from end to end with a sack of gold and remain untouched, it was certainly not here. George was not so vainglorious as to attribute the cleaner, wider streets and the sashed windows of the town, at least in the better areas if one was being realistic, to his family's own munificence alone. Charity had limits. And besides, if one was being honest, knowing his father, this use of their newfound fortune had as much to do with the proclamation of their name as it was with keeping people out of a workhouse. Still, the sense of having accomplished, or at least having helped to accomplish something material and good in the world, certainly felt sweet. His feet finally carried him to a small, well-appointed house that was located not far from a goldsmith and the better sort of a draper. It was not so grand a residence as to boast a footman opening the door to visitors, but it was not so poor as to force the mistress of the house to do that herself either. Instead, George was greeted inside by a maid, who called out to her employers quickly, as though she was unsure as to how exactly to deal with this visitor alone. They did not take long to appear and to hurriedly help him settle in the parlour. The maid was dispatched to bring the guest a dish of coffee, since the Frasers knew that the younger Trevelyan, the only Trevelyan now, did not much care for the milder or more soothing sorts of beverages. He liked to keep himself alert. Isabella's request of hot chocolate at breakfast came unbidden to his mind. It was an innocuous request, and one he had nothing against. Indeed, it was something of the kind he expected. It would have been rather strange if he demanded her to be something other than she was, a young lady fresh out of the schoolroom, accustomed to the slow and fine things of her home. He knew Mr Fraser of old. The latter, after all, was the man who had read his father's will out all those years ago the will that proclaimed Andrew to be the new Earl of Earth. Not for long, of course. Mrs Fraser was rather an unknown quantity to him, so instead of trying to dazzle her with flourishes of polite conversation and inevitably making a fool of himself, George decided it was better to use his age-old tactic and avoid the matter. Not that Mrs Fraser needed much encouragement, as soon as the coffee was brought, she started talking about the successes of the boy, as though she were his schoolmistress. He is such a fine lad, she said. He is reading very quickly now, and his handwriting is a sight to behold. I'm glad to hear that, George replied, not without awkwardness. What was one supposed to say to such revelations? I actually think he might be ready to learn a foreign language, the woman added. French, perhaps, or German. She did not mention Latin, George noticed. She clearly did not think he intended the sort of future for the boy that would require the learning of the language of the ancients. That sounds like a good idea. Knowledge settles quicker when one is young. Yes, but since neither me nor Mr Fraser are proficient in these tongues... Ah! It dawned on him, of course. I will oversee the hiring of a suitable tutor, George replied, resigning himself to the task. And... Pay for his services, he added after a pause, just to soothe the couple's anxious looks. Well, these were understandable, of course. However, they might have once lamented the absence of children of their own. Bringing up a son required a considerable expense. It occurred to George that he did not exactly lie to his wife in this matter. In a way, he did indeed come here to talk to his lawyer. Chapter 4 Isabella took care to choose the gown for this particular dinner. It was not a special occasion, but it might as well have been. She did not know many womanly tricks to make oneself irresistible, because although she delighted in well-made and pretty frocks as much as her sister did, she never quite mastered the effortless command of trims and colours that came to her mother and sister naturally. In the end, 
guided by conscious knowledge more than by instinct, she picked a pink muslin dress with fine white embroidery. She knew that, if nothing else, it made her skin look healthy. She had a plan for tonight, and she hoped to carry it out well. However, for a second, she wished real-life dialogues could be written as easily and fluently as those composed of ink on paper. They dined simply, which was to her taste. But it certainly was not the gruel that the horrified Belinda prophesied for her when she first heard about the match. Not that Isabella had ever believed her. She knew that the Highlands had changed a lot since the days of scornful Dr Johnson's travels there, to say nothing of the still earlier, mistier times of mighty chiefs. The meal that day was comprised of a brace of muir fowl, the bird carved expertly, salmon from the local river for the fish course, and some quite good wine. Isabella was not sure how to approach the subject. Could she even ask another person what exactly she was supposed to do? Would the question be made more or less awkward if the person in question was her husband? I trust you are tired from the road. Isabella started with the most innocuous comment she could imagine. The most innocuous was also the most trite, but then these things often went hand in hand. Not much. George Trevelyan shrugged his shoulders. I am well used both to the road and the weather. And to the sort of food they serve at the inns. No, I suppose no one can completely get used to that. The moment of fleeting levity in his tone encouraged her. Did your mother... At the last possible moment, Isabella's resolve failed her. It did not sound natural. It was a jagged way to ask the question. If any of the dialogue in her own stories featured such a transition, she would have rewritten it substantially on the second attempt. Did your mother travel with you often when she was alive? She asked instead. To consult with her family lawyer, you mean? No, that was my father's business. Well, naturally, but I mean longer journeys, Isabella improvised. Say, when you went down to London, did she come with you? Oh, of course she did. My father is not a villain from a gothic novel to lock his wife in a tower of stone. She enjoyed all the delight to the capital when the season allowed. Blood rushed to Isabella's cheeks at the mention of the novels. Could it be possible that he knew about her pursuits, or even about... No, he could not have. She concealed the former well enough, and had barely started on the latter. Did you go there often? Often enough. She was determined that I and my brother both were going to receive an urbane education. I imagine your brother had enjoyed the surroundings, Isabella ventured. That did it quite immensely. What did you usually do there? The sorts of things most young men do. Went to the theatres, enjoyed the rides in Hyde Park. These were not all of the things that young men about town usually enjoyed. Even Isabella, for all her sheltered upbringing, knew that. Was that all you did? She could not help but tease him. No. I had also spent quite a lot of time hauling Andrew out of trouble. But then you asked me what did I enjoy, not what did I do. Suddenly Isabella felt very uncomfortable. She had assumed that her husband would not mind reminiscing of his older brother, who sounded like a charming young man who also died a heroic death. But perhaps that heroic death, even if it was several years in the past, was to him too recent. Some wounds took longer to heal. Indeed, she could not imagine how long it would have taken for her heart to stop bleeding if something happened to her little sister. The windows remained closed, so perhaps it was merely the draughts seeping between the stones and through cracks, but it felt as though the room grew colder. I wonder... Now she could not ask him about his mother's domestic duties. Not now, not any more. I wonder if you could tell me... A little about the local notables. Notables? Are you planning to pay some calls? I thought it would be reasonable of me to make acquaintances. Some sober married women. Perhaps they would impart some of the sobriety to me. If she had to go the crooked way, she would. Like the crab she had once seen on the seashore in Brighton. But go all the way, she would. There is the pastor's wife, Mrs. Pamela Milne. Indeed, I've heard she was positively fretting about your arrival. Perhaps your conversation would put her at ease. 
It is kind of you, Isabella said with complete honesty, to say that a conversation with me could put anyone at ease. Chapter 5 Thank you, Mrs. Mackenzie, that would be all, Isabella said. Then she hesitated. On the one hand, she dearly wanted to return to the book lying now by her side, whose reading was interrupted by the need to plan the next week's menu with the housekeeper. On the other hand, there was something she needed to ask. In fact, I wonder if there's anything else I must do. Oh, no, my lady, I have heard everything I need. The housekeeper made a few steps toward the drawing room's door, but Isabella raised her hand hurriedly. Oh, sure, I have a sense there is something you expect of me, that there is something everyone expects of me. That I expect of you? Oh, I would hardly dare to burden you with my expectations, my... Mrs Mackenzie, please. I might be young and untried, but I am not a slip of a girl just out of the schoolroom, nor am I an utter fool. I know there is more to being the lady of an estate than planning menus from time to time and ornamenting the drawing room. I must have other duties. If you could tell me what these are. Oh, forgive me this remark, but you are so like his lordship sometimes. One could hardly think of two people better suited to each other now that I think of it. He had always spoken of duties and of duty and of the ways to do right by others even if these others did not ask him to or did not deserve it. Isabella could not help but marvel at the housekeeper's frankness. Of course, she was an old retainer, but any noble household in London, or in the South in general, would have looked askance, at the very least, at a servant so free with her tongue. However, this strange feature, Isabella wondered if it was something pertaining to the Highlands or simply to this house, could be of great help now. I simply want to do right by my husband. The housekeeper's lined face softened almost imperceptibly. You should not worry about that, my lady, I assure you. His lordship bears you no grudges. Is that why he barely talks to me? Isabella could not help thinking. Is that why he barely says three words to me, even at dinner? She had known that whatever match her family arranged for her one day, was likely to be a matter of dowries and incomes, and that her future husband, whomever he would be, would likely be more interested in the former than anything about her person. But seeing it play out in practice, in flesh and blood, rankled. She could not have imagined in the days of girlhood just how much it would hurt. If he had worried about his manner, the housekeeper continued, then pray pay no heed. He has always been thus, ever since he was a bairn, all silent and tight-lipped. Although perhaps he seemed even more so next to the late Master Andrew. What was the late Earl like? He had not been Earl for very long, poor lad. He certainly had a gift for giving others a merry dance long before he inherited. I imagine my husband took it badly, Isabella hazarded a guess. Not so badly as badly. He had always accepted it. We all accept that the sun and moon are different, don't we? Though I suppose, Mrs Mackenzie ended thoughtfully after a pause, it could not have been all that pleasant that Master Andrew always got to be the bonny Prince Charlie when they played at Rebellion. The Rebellion of 45? The very same, the housekeeper nodded. You would hardly hear the talk of any other if you speak to old men or their widows. I thought there was an opinion that the loss in the rebellion was not all terrible for the Highlands in the long term, Isabella ventured. That is, it broke the power of the old chiefs who lived by cattle raiding. She knew she was on relatively safe ground with this one. She had studied the history of the family she was marrying into, and knew that the earls of Earth were not one of those chiefs with their armed retainers and petty fortresses. Indeed, they were one of those armed retainers, and would have never reached their present state of independent grandeur had the country remained what it was. If not for the repercussions for the rebellion that broke the old powers, the Trevelyans would have never been able to rise as high as they did. They would have certainly never been able to afford or even imagine a place like this very drawing room, with its sash windows and upholstery bought on Edinburgh High Street. Still, the softness vanished from the housekeeper's expression. 
a loss is a loss, my lady. There had never been a country under heavens that was glad to be bested. I suppose, Isabella conceded, her cheeks burning a little. So the late Earl had always played the bonny Prince Charlie, who was my husband in these games then. One of his enemies, of course. Isabella wondered how did it feel for a child with any tenderness in his soul, and she was of a firm opinion that all children had it, even the stoic and silent ones such as her husband was described to have been, to be cast as an enemy to be vanquished over and over again. His fair brother, the bonny prince, returned to reclaim his throne, himself his dark nemesis. For she did not doubt that, however the matters turned out to be in the real rebellion, the version children played out in the courtyards of their father's homes ended in victory. The sun and the moon, only this time the sun has set. That could be a good premise for a gothic novel, Isabella realised. Perhaps for the villain's backstory, or even for the plot itself. The hero, a handsome, generous, if somewhat foolish heir. The villain, his younger brother prone to silent scheming. Of course, she did not believe there was any foul play in Andrew Trevelyan's actual death in battle so far away from home. She definitely did not believe her husband capable of dark plots either. But the situation gave her an idea. It could be a good novel. All chills and thrills and windswept castles that always sold ever since the days of Anne Radcliffe. Of course... She would likely have to transport the characters to Italy, as for some reason her readers found the chills and thrills in question better when the setting was foreign and Catholic. But she could work with that. She could work with that. She had thought that of her marriage too, of course, but if her hope of finding any contentment in this marriage was steadily vanishing, she could at least wring some joy out of her writing. There were worse ways to find solace in the world, especially when it came to neglected wives. The expression in the older woman's eyes could only be described as that of astonishment. Your ladyship, Mrs Milne exclaimed, you really did not have to take such pains as that for my sake, that is for sure. Isabella was perplexed for a second, then looked down upon herself and realised that the parson's wife was probably referring to her dress. She did not think it a particularly fine one, during her first season, it was certainly good enough for morning visits, decorated with floral patterns of Huguenot lace as it was. However, one would have rather expired on the spot than attend a dinner in it. And was this not a morning visit? I suppose I do have to have some new wardrobe made for myself, Isabella replied with a nervous laugh, although I imagine I would need some guidance in that, she added in her mind. But you look very fine. Mrs Milne hastened to assure her. If your fear is that I'm going to stay for dinner, let me set you at ease. I have my flaws, but I have no intention of eating my own tenants out of house and home. My own tenants. How heavy that sounded. And Isabella had to admit, not unpleasant. She was a grown married woman now. It was not simply a household that was on her shoulders, but an estate and a large one. These people's commonwealth was her responsibility. In fact, she added when seated in the modest parlour, my reason for coming is rather pragmatic. At this, the older woman's face suddenly hardened. Please do not trouble yourself, your ladyship. The income from the glebe lens is small, that is true, but we are managing very well. Besides, we don't have many children and... Or, oh, you misunderstand, I did not mean to insult you by offering you charity... In fact, it is I who needs help. You see, there are so many things in the running of an estate like this that I am woefully ignorant about. The older woman's shoulders downright slumped with relief. Forgive me for suspecting you of something of this kind, she said. It is only some people have such notions. I understand that no one thinks it pleasant to be thought of as unable to provide for their own sustenance. I suppose it is so everywhere, then. Although I don't think that in any corner of the world there are people as proud as here. Do you know the story of the widow's house, your ladyship? Isabella shook her head. It was one of the late Earl's ideas, the parson's wife continued. The old 
late adults, I mean, not that of the poor young man who died so recently. He had built a cottage for the poorer sort of widows, the kind who could not provide for themselves, and leased it to the lot of them for free, or as close as free. It sounds a good Christian undertaking to me. And they needed help too, not like us. For a while, everything went well. But then the women heard that some people were talking of their new house as lodgings for the poor. They were so terribly distressed at being thought of as living in a gentler version of the workhouse that, well, it had not been proven, not exactly, but I'm sure it was one of them who set fire to the place in the night. At least it was quite suspicious that all of them escaped unscathed and most of their meagre possessions too. How horrible. What happened to the poor widows after? The old earl had quite a temper. It was no brute, but if someone slighted him or disregarded him or disrespected him in other ways, one could expect no mercy. He made it clear they wanted nothing to do with projects of this kind any more. Some are claiming the widows were foolish and ungrateful, and I agree, they rather over-egged the pudding when it came to their pride. But how would anyone like to be called what they were? Not me nor would any other people I know here. I know people back home who would not have cared to be referred to as recipients of charity either, but probably not to the extent of burning down the house. Oh, that was a rare case, Mrs Milne hastened to reassure her. Please do not think wild things of this nature occur here every day. I would not dream of that, Isabella said, her voice not nearly as confident as it was when she knocked upon the cottage door. Truth be told, in a way, it is precisely this manner of problem that I need your help with, Mrs. Milne. My mother has taught me what I need to know about managing the state, of course, but I suspect she did not mean an estate of this size. Besides, not one so remote. I have made some calculations, and importing so many things from the city would produce a rather alarming cost. Isabella passed her the sheet of paper upon which she had made her painstaking calculations sitting straight-backed and anxious like a pupil, awaiting the judgment of the governess. Mrs. Milne's forehead creased. Of course one does not import many things from the city, your ladyship. That would have been ruinous. Yes, even for you, if you excuse my boldness. Your boldness is what I came here for, Isabella replied, it occurring to her that this was the first time when she'd heard Mrs. Milne or anyone else apologise for frank speech. One can make beer on the grounds, the pastor's wife continued, and wine too. The dairy is very important, even for a household such as ours, let alone for one such as yours. I have learned to manage mine so well that most of our milk and cheese is bought at market day in town. The dear Mr Milne even complains that I have too little milk left for him. He has a terrible liking for cream, the poor man, although I suspect that I should not call him poor. Once I caught him red-handed, sneaking into my dairy, and when I burst upon him with his lips still milk-wet, he tried to persuade me there was an explanation that would prove him completely innocent. I had lost my temper that day, rather. He stopped stealing my milk after that, or, Mrs Milne added realistically, at least he became more circumspect with it. Isabella could not help but smile at this story. Unbidden, a thought came into her head. Might it be possible that one day her own marriage would be just such an abode of easy affection? Her parents' marriage was not anything of the kind that she knew. There was no brutality in it, but little warmth either. What if her own union with George Trevelyan, the Earl of Erth, would only remain that of duty? She saw it in her mind's eye for a second, decades upon decades unfolding in front of her, a cold expanse. Are you quite well, your ladyship? I have never been better, Isabella smiled, this time less than genuinely. Indeed, I am perfectly ready for my lessons. Chapter 6 The thick canopy of the wood only allowed slight strands of the sun in. If not for the dark greenery of the trees themselves, one might have thought that the summer did not exist here. To be fair, it was not exactly rioting, even in the open gardens of the castle, which at the moment seemed incredibly far away. George was striding through the forest path with fast, purposeful steps. He knew the route well, 
He had walked it hundreds of times. Suddenly, he saw a flash of green in the corner of his eye. He turned rapidly toward the source. It was not an easy thing to notice, the green on green, but his instincts were honed and his eyes sharply sensitive to danger. Who is there? He called out into nowhere. A rustle in the bushes was his reply. Then his wife emerged. She was wearing a large green bonnet, a simple frock and thick-soled boots, the kind he had never seen her wear before. In her left hand, she held a basket. At the bottom of it, he could see red and black berries glistening with colour. What are you doing here? George asked before thinking. If his tone and reaction seemed suspicious to her, however, she did not show it. Instead, his wife smiled and raised the basket like a hunter, showing him his prey. I was gathering everything for the still room, my lord. For the still room? Yes, gooseberries, currant, cowslip, elderberry. It turns out there is quite a wealth of good berries in these woods. He could remember making a tiffin of these many a time when he and Andre ran riot in the forest, playing at the noble outlaws of the greenwood. He had been a child then, though. For a second, George imagined his prim and proper lady wife running along the forest path, her bonnet discarded and her mouth crimson with the juice. The image lingered for a second, even though it was only mildly amusing. I have already gathered the herbs, his countess continued. Once everything is ready, I can start with the making of wine. You did not interest yourself in these matters before. I did not know what to interest myself in, she corrected him. Of course, my mother taught me something about being the mistress of an estate, but she thought I would marry the son of one of their friends from the home counties, where ladies engage themselves in more supervising than doing, if that. Truth be told, I am rather excited to try myself at this new venture. She smiled with a sudden boldness. If everything goes well, soon we will have a fine homemade wine to drink at dinner, my lord. No need of the expense of sending for it to Edinburgh. Suddenly, George felt a great warmth toward her. She was a stranger, secretive and nosy at the same time, but by God she was sensible and she was thoughtful. I would like that very much, he said, looking into her eyes. Here, among the dark green shadows, the blue flecks in them seemed to stand out all the brighter. Did Mrs. Mackenzie instruct you? The housekeeper, oh no, if it were her decision to make, she would have kept the running of the house in her own hands, with no threat of disturbance from the new mistress. No, I had to circumnavigate her the way the old explorers used to circumnavigate Africa and find myself other mentors. I rather thought Mrs. Mackenzie was fond of you. He could not help but recall the housekeeper's insistence that he should go and meet his bride en route. Fond, perhaps. But this woman has been with your family for how long? Decades upon decades. I am not sure even Mrs. Mackenzie herself will tell you the true number. Well, exactly. I am not vexed with her. Castle Earth is the only home she has in the whole world, and it would be strange if she wasn't jealous of me intervening in the running of it. I can talk to her. Don't, I pray. I have never thought myself particularly skilled in the feminine arts of quiet negotiation, she added. But even I know that in some cases it is better for the man at the house not to enter the fray, where the wife and the housekeeper are concerned. You approach it as a battle, it seems. However ridiculous the comparison was, he could not help but let a shadow of a smile touch his lips. Oh, and I am planning the conduct of my campaign on multiple fronts. I am thinking to involve myself in the soap boiling, in the feather cleaning, and possibly the dairy. George recalled his mother the late countess, who, for all her supposed Viking pride, never thought herself too delicate for the brewery and the dairy. Naturally, she did not perform this task on her own, and when he was growing from a quiet child into an awkward adolescent, he was often flustered by the appearances of pretty young maids busying themselves with a boiling vat of what would one day become orange wine. Andrew was just as interested, and unlike George, he always had a ready smile and a ready compliment on his lips. Perhaps that was why Andrew was often rewarded with kisses, and George merely with laughter. Not that he was bitter about it. Dalliances were never his idea of amusement. At that, another image entered his mind. Sudden and unbidden, his fine-skinned, grey-eyed wife, her cheeks flushed with the wine steam and her eyes gleaming, 
her hair tied behind with a kerchief instead of being concealed by a bonnet, and a lock or two escaping about her ears. The notion was ridiculous, of course. The woman in his imagination had more in common with a ruddy peasant than with the noble lady he had married. But the fancies of men, and perhaps women too, had little to do with the logic and decrees of politeness. "'Where are you going?' Isabella asked. Her voice, and even more so her question, brought George back to reality. "'I am merely taking a stroll,' he lied. The real world reasserted itself around him, and all the stark need for secrecy with it. "'Where can I join after I am finished with my task? In fact, I think I only need—' "'I don't think it would be wise.' George cut the notion off hurriedly. "'Attraction or no, affection or no, there were things he was not meant to share with his new wife, with his rule-bound, law-bound, English-born wife.' He almost regretted his words, if not the impetus that lay behind them. The enthusiasm bled out of Isabella's expression. For a second, George thought she was going to argue. He almost wished she would. But of course, she did not. She had been brought up to be good and modest and gentle, and when someone told her they did not want her company, she accepted it. I see, Isabella murmured. Very well. I hope you will enjoy your walk, my lord. And I wish you a good and fruitful gathering, my lady. Isabella stared at her husband's retreating back, feeling vexed beyond belief, even though she was trying not to show it. His curt dismissal of her could not have been caused by her activities. If anything, he seemed to approve of those. Perhaps he was displeased by her simple and unkempt appearance today, more befitting a village girl than a lady of the manor. Isabella looked down at her Sutton half-boots. She had never worn anything of the kind before. They seemed a galaxy away from the slim slippers she wore to ballrooms and musical parties during her season. But surely George Trevelyan was not one of those unreasonable men who thought that, even when in the midst of the domestic work, their wives ought to be elegant in a blue muslin like they were at dinner. When he had encountered her by accident this morning, Isabella secretly nurtured the hope that this new busyness of hers with the day-to-day -day production on the estate would please him. But it seemed not to. It seemed that nothing did. Isabella suddenly felt tired. Tired and neglected and somewhat insulted. She waited until her husband was far enough and set out after him, trying to step softly. That was no mean trick in the forest, then she knew far worse than he did, but she was doing her best, as ever, to be cautious, and kept one eye on the ground so as not to step on some twig and make it snap loudly. He did not look back, not once. His stride was purposeful, his steps quick. Had Isabella been less inclined to exercise and bracing walks, she would have had trouble keeping up with him. Even as it was, she felt a slight pain in her side before too long. They were heading deeper into the earth lands. The light between the trees was growing, and it was clear they were nearing the way out of the woods. Isabella made herself walk slower, step more carefully. It would not do her much good to suddenly find herself in an open space where no caution would shield her presence. She could smell a slight scent of water. They were nearing the loch. Isabella stayed among the trees hiding in the shadows of a particularly mighty oak, and watched her husband as he walked down to the shore of the great lake. Her heart skipped a beat for a second as an absurd thought entered her head. Perhaps he was planning to meet someone here, someone who most definitely would not desire the presence of his wife. She would hardly have the right to interfere even then, would she? Men had their amusements, even married men. The wisest thing a wife could do was to avert her eyes and mind her own conduct. She knew all that, in theory, but God, it felt wretched to brace oneself to put that into practice. The sunlight was still on the steely blue water. George Trevelyan set out along the shore. Still too wary, Isabella remained where she was, following him with her eyes. The boathouse was a bigger building than she had expected. 
Her husband's late family members must have been greatly fond of boating, of slow afternoons on a mirror-smooth lake. But the boat that she saw let down upon the water was a humble vessel, not one usually associated with the leisure of gentlemen. Not the official sorts of leisure, anyhow. Isabella saw him climb into the boat, push away from the banks of the loch, and start rowing towards the small island in the middle of the lake. At this, Isabella turned away. Perhaps this is not what it looks like, she reasoned with herself. She was jumping to conclusions. Then who do you suppose is waiting for him there, in that secret place? Her inner voice whispered. A fencing instructor? Chapter 7 Isabella stopped writing as soon as she heard the steps nearing from the corridor. Her hands flew into the flurry of motions that were as familiar to her as the dawn, putting away the inkwell, drying the quills, covering the paper. She had learned these simple tricks and the swiftness of their execution at home at the time of her first literary exercises. Even when her little diversion became known to her parents, the habits persisted. All for the best, for although her father grudgingly allowed the publications under a pen name, it was wise not to remind him overmuch of his daughter's unseemly pursuits, lest he changed his mind. In short, when the door opened, Isabella was sitting, prim as a schoolgirl, in front of the virginly clear desk. And she raised her eyes from it and saw her husband standing on the threshold. My lord, she said, not without some nerves, did you want to speak to me? Yes, in fact, <clears throat> he coughed. I wonder if you might like to accompany me on a ride. The weather is uncommonly fine today and I thought you might like to see the estate. In all the weeks she had lived here as the mistress of the house, this was the first time George Trevelyan invited her for such a diversion. The implication was clear. This was supposed to be an apology. Isabella thought of the boat on the lake, on the lonely island, and the person who was probably waiting there. The memory tugged painfully at her heart. Keeping a mistress was one thing, but keeping a mistress so openly was an insult. What kind of diversion? What sort of entertainment could be an adequate apology for that? And yet, what exactly would she gain by refusing? Only her husband's resentment of her supposedly high-handed ways. So, Isabella made herself smile and replied, Of course, only let me change into my riding habit. In truth, it did not take that much time. Isabella was not one of the Dianas who wore a riding habit, even on visits or walks to the church, but she was well acquainted with the garment nonetheless. The green riding habit went over a cotton slip, and on her head Isabella put a black hat with a feather. She glanced into the mirror. Diana, she might not have been, but she certainly looked very bright and sporting right now. I must confess, she said, following her husband into the yard, riding is not among my best accomplishments. There is no need for a false modesty. I dearly wish it had been false. Then I suppose I had been right in my choice of horse for you. The pale Eliza is not a hot-blooded filly, but neither is she a tame pony. All in all, a good horse. Perhaps it was her husband's gaze, clearly drawn to her figure that was outlined starker than ever by the riding habit, but Isabella felt blood rushing to her cheeks. Thank you, she murmured. This should suit my writing abilities. I have also thought it would suit your general character. It felt warming. There was no other word for it. Isabella could not help but feel the warmth of a small ember glowing somewhere in her chest at the notion that a man as distant, and as she now knew, otherwise preoccupied, as her husband paid any heed to her general character, she climbed up into the saddle, and soon found out that the pale Eliza's trot was indeed a comfortable one. Indeed, in a few minutes, she felt as though her body and spirit both had been used to riding this filly for years. You're a good horse, Isabella whispered, letting the reins go with one hand and stroking her fingers through pale Eliza's mane. You are certainly getting a carrot from me once we come back to the stables. You like animals, I see, George Trevelyan commented. 
I confess I do. If there was something I had been greatly attached to when it came to my family's country house, it was the abundance of horses and hunting dogs. Once I was past the age when being hoidenish was seen as amusing, I could not spend quite as much time with them. But doing so had always left me soothed and refreshed, whether I was a child or a woman. There is something very really simple in animals, George Trevelyan nodded, or rather everything about them. Their needs are simple, their lives are simple. They want love in its most direct and primal forms and return it too. There are no silent debts with them. There are no unspoken duties beyond the obvious ones. There was a distant quality to his tone. They were clearly veering close to some topic that brought him pain. On one hand, Isabella knew it was unseemly to probe. On the other, she wanted to know. To know, and, if possible, to help. The dilemma was mercifully resolved when she saw the view that unfolded around her once they rode away from the carefully trimmed alleys of the park. The fields of purple heather were unimaginably bright all around them, the colour standing out especially radiantly against the pale skies. Isabella's breath caught in her throat. It was one thing to see engravings, or even to glimpse these landscapes out of the window of a comfortable carriage. It was another to be out there, alone in the wild nature, its stark beauty overwhelming. Or rather, not completely alone. I see you are impressed, her husband noted. It is magnificent, Isabella replied. In the back of her mind, she was already churning through the words, thinking of literary descriptions of it all that would be worthy of being put on paper. It is sublime. That is the word they use, isn't it? The sublime versus the beautiful. Such debates are not to my taste, but I have read a couple of works on the topic. My father had assembled a good library. You were a studious child then. I was. My parents thought of my going into the church when I grew up. She couldn't help but laugh a little at the notion, imagining this gloomy, imposing man trying to inspire hope and gentle thoughts in his flock. Do you find it funny? He raised his eyebrows. There are not that many paths for younger sons found on this earth. Oh, I know. It is only... I would have thought that if you were to choose one of them, I find it rather easier to imagine you in the army. I was going to join the army when the war started. The world was awfully quiet around them, the only sound being that of the wind. But you did not? Isabella half asked, half stated. She realised that although she was now married to this man, she knew so little about him that she could not even say for sure what role he played in the conflict that was now painting the seas with crimson. Andrew did it first. He claimed he wanted to serve his country, I strongly suspect he wanted to serve his own sense of glory. It all seemed a lark to him. Her father forbade me to follow suit. I was, after all, the spare, should anything happen to the heir. That was prudent of him, Isabella said. What would have happened to the estate had you shared your brother's fate? You are not wrong. But Andrew has found his glory, in a way. He will remain forever brave and young and a ghost glowing in scarlet. I, on the other hand, am a man of flesh and blood, weak and flawed. I know, my lady. I know I will always seem dull and fumbling next to him. Isabella shivered, and the cold wind had nothing to do with it. But did he not inherit the title only a few years after the war started? She asked. Why did he not come back to Scotland? People would have understood him. For the same reason, Achilles did not come back to his own homeland when he could. He paused, evidently realising that a young lady of conventional education might be ignorant of the hero in question. However, Isabella nodded. He was given a choice, to die of old age, but soon forgotten, or at the walls of Troy, his name to be sung through eternity. Is that what your brother wanted? He did. Except I'm not sure he believed he would die there. After several years on the continent, he might have thought himself invincible, beloved of fate. But fate is cruel to her beloveds. I remember the day the war started, Isabella said. You were a child then, were you not? I ceased being a child that day. They hid the news from us at first, but I managed to eavesdrop by the door of my father's study. 
It seems you have a wicked side to you, my lady. Isabella looked at her husband with some amazement. Did he genuinely just make a joke? She returned to her story hurriedly. The news, it shook me to the core. Of course, I did not quite understand the magnitude by then. But although I was still in the schoolroom, I was not exactly a babe. I knew I had to break it to Belinda and Tommy before someone else did. Adults have the propensity to be somewhat heartless to children, even without intending it. God, I know it well. So I went to the nursery, gathered my brother and sister around me, and explained it to them as best I could. I think I drew on every example of fictional courage and conflict I had known, from storybooks to Beowulf and the Iliad. I thought it might help to soothe them. But in truth, I am afraid some of the examples went over their little heads. She remembered that day in stark clarity. The busy murmurs downstairs. The drawn curtains in the nursery. Two children, and the girl who was not a child any more, sitting in a circle. The latter telling them of the situation in that terribly earnest voice that some too mature, too well-read children use. It was not that dark in the room. It could not have been that dark. But in Isabella's mind's eye, the nursery was swimming in its own twilight, like some undersea kingdom from a tale. Did it work? her husband asked. Isabella nodded. When our father did break the news to us in the evening, my siblings had amazed him with their composure and good cheer. Even Belinda did not cry. He was rather surprised. Mother had suspected something, I think. After which he drew me aside and commended me on being such a good, responsible elder sister. It was perhaps then that Isabella first felt the strange, cool pleasure of duty well fulfilled. The other prominent time she felt like this was when she had agreed to the match that led her to Castle Earth in the first place. No one praised her this time, of course, but why should they have? She was an adult woman, and agreeing to a good match was simply what was expected of her. What is startling and commendable the first time is simply an expectation on the hundredth. She should have known that. But still, she felt some pinprick of disappointment. You are a very good woman, my lady. I simply did what I had to do. I was the elder sister, after all. If all elder siblings thought as you did, the world might have been a much better place. Here it was, this flush of prideful pleasure and being praised for a duty done. Perhaps it was a sign. Isabella did not know who had been waiting for him on that island in the middle of the loch. She did not want to know. But whomever she was, whatever appetite she fed, she could never be a true rival to her. Not when it came to things like this. Or at least Isabella told herself so. But then she was very skilled at massaging yearnings into beliefs and outcomes into desirability. An idea came into her head. I wonder, Isabella said, turning to her husband, if you would mind us giving a small dinner soon just to introduce me to the local society. After all, not only have they never seen me, I must seem a great stranger to them. It is sensible. Provided the affair is not going to be too grandiose, I must confess dinners on a ducal scale give me headaches. Headaches? I would never thought you would be so delicate, my lord, Isabella teased him, unable to help it. I work to hide it well. You are an industrious man, do you happen to have any recommendations on whom I should invite? I would leave it to your discretion. I would have gladly exercised it, but I barely know any names. They do not have to be great notables, merely suitable people. I can give you a list of such persons in the vicinity, George Trevelyan proposed, so that you could have your pick. So, you like lists too? I always have. I could never resist a good list. Isabella confessed, especially when I... She closed her lips. She almost said, when I outline my novels. He raised his eyebrows, prompting her to finish the sentence. When they deal with intricate matters such as these, Isabella found the words, I know they are mere signs on paper, but they do tend to make the world a much more orderly place. I often wish the world had been more so. 
Oh, yes, life would have been much more rationally composed in that case. Say, if all the great heads of nations wrote the cost of continental wars in a list, in gold and blood, the fighting might have ceased altogether. Silence hung between them like gunpowder smoke. The unspoken implication was that in that case, his brother would have been alive. Andrew would have been with us today in that case, the Earl replied, as though reading her mind. Then he added, the strange resignation in his voice, and he, not I, would have had you for a wife in that case. Powerful though they were, lists were not omnipotent, and there were several times when Isabella feared that her first dinner as the lady of the house was going to be a complete fiasco. To make things easier and more manageable, she did not go with the old-fashioned French way of serving food, with its dozens of dishes upon the table at once, such a way of requiring inhuman efforts from the kitchen and the hostess alike. The other custom, the custom she had first seen and learned during her first and last season, was instead for each guest to be served dishes in strict succession. She knew that some people, especially older men and women, used to the sumptuous dinners of her parents' generation, grumbled about such new-fangled fashions as mere parsimony. But Isabella was a woman of a practical bent, and she thought that, since no guest would leave hungry or dissatisfied with the quality of their fish and fowl, a dinner could surely be called good and pleasant without emulating the splendour of ancient Rome. As it was, the meal consisted of a hot mulligatawny soup as a touch of daring, turbot surrounded by smelts and some woodcocks and quails. April was, after all, the last month when fresh wildfowl could be enjoyed at any table, however grand, and it would have been senseless not to take advantage of the fact. Isabella herself could hardly eat. She was too busy watching the expressions of the guests, and her stomach sometimes clenched when it seemed to her that she detected displeasure or boredom. The seats at the table were filled with the families of local squires, the grand grants of Rothy Murchus, and lastly the man who was introduced to her as a fellow countryman from the south, Thomas Darnley, an officer of the excise. There was nothing particularly strange, much less outrageous, about the last man's behaviour, but Isabella decided she did not like the way he glanced at her several times too many and several measures too intently. She wondered once if her gown for the evening was too revealing, but she had eschewed the London fashions for dresses of thin muslin and thinner stockings, and the first creations of the mantua maker from Edinburgh had been finished a mere week before the dinner party. She was wearing a gown of green jaconet, and her stockings were most definitely of wool. She did her best to be a lively hostess, the soul of conversation. That last title had never belonged to her by right, even in her days in the South, and she feared that here winning it would be completely impossible. However, she found out that, although her knowledge of local matters was indeed negligible, so far, she added in her mind, however, the master of the Rothy Murchus and his wife had spent many months in the capital and were glad to speak to her of the plays they both liked, even regaling her with stories of those days when the Drury Lane Theatre was under the management of the great Garrick. In truth, she would have dearly liked to spend the whole evening in conversation with that couple, but she knew that that was not how a good hostess did things. So, when the time for a cheese and fruit had come, she had to engage Mr. Darnley in conversation, whether she wanted that or not. I congratulate you, your ladyship, he said, looking at her with his unnerving pale eyes. You have lit a constellation in the wilderness. He added these words after lowering his voice. Isabella could not help but throw a glance at her husband, but sitting where he was, he could not have heard. She was to deal with this challenge herself. I'm sorry, Mr. Donnelly, you are mistaken on two fronts. Far be it from me to correct a guest, but my efforts have been very modest, and Eth is hardly a wilderness. Perhaps I spoke too boldly, he corrected himself, but you do have to agree that it is hardly the pinnacle of social pleasures. I strongly suspect I imagine you missed the tone. You mistake me, Mr. Donnelly. I have never been a creature of great gaiety, and if anything, the position of my new home is well suited to me. The estate is quite self-sufficient, and there is both virtue and practical value in that. I imagine it is. 
I have to say your words cross the line between boldness and something else entirely. Please forgive me, your ladyship. His lordship and I have not always agreed in many matters. And yet you have accepted our invitation. Some disagreements are not the reason not to be civil, he replied. Besides, I am not such a brute as to allow them to mar my perception of his family. Meaning his wife. Despite the warmth of her attire, Isabella could not help but feel a shiver running across her skin. On one hand, his words made sense. She had known her father to dine with men he felt no affection for, even men from the opposing political party. And yet, she felt there was something behind them, something more, something darker. I am glad to hear that, she said, not feeling glad at all. But his lordship is my husband. Whatever the reason for your enmity, he is a good and honourable man and a kind spouse to me. He was, she realised. She did not need to put a bright smile upon a bad situation, as she had once feared she would have to, when she was first betrothed to the near stranger. In all matters save one, her husband had really been kind to her, even indulgent. As for his honour, one only needed to ask the farmers on his land. All matters save the one where very few husbands could be expected to be faithful. It occurred to George that he had not known so convivial a supper since the dark day when his mother passed away. Neither his father's austerity nor his brother's raucous parties were exactly to his taste, and he knew they were not to the taste of the elegant Grants either. He had always considered the father of the family to be his friend, and just for enticing them all back to earth, Isabella deserved his thanks. His gaze shifted to his wife, who was currently in a busy conversation with Thomas Darnley. The expression on her brow surprised him. It possessed such determined fierceness as he had never seen upon her face before. She was probably herself not aware that she demonstrated it right now, or else, based on everything he had heard from her, she would have been mortified. Thomas Darnley. George could not stand the sight of that weasel of a man. What on earth possessed him to even accept this invitation? Perhaps, of course, Mr Darnley treasured the maxim of keeping one's enemies close. It seemed that Isabella shared George's thoughts on the subject, whatever she was saying right now in particular. They had that much in common, George thought. The dislike for Thomas Darnley and the love of lists. He, George, was going to finally come up to her bedchamber tonight, he realised. It did not matter that he felt no great passion for her. He had a duty to her to fulfil. She deserved it, after those long and no doubt wretched weeks when she must have wondered whether she was his wife in truth. Not one to postpone his tasks, George went to her bedroom soon after the supper had ended, and the last of the guests had been given the host's good wishes. However, the room was empty. His wife was probably still downstairs talking to the housekeeper and discussing the successes and faults of tonight's affair. George could not quite imagine what faults she could have found with it, for he was not a man of exquisite taste, but he wholeheartedly believed in the power of one's nerves to invent one. Something caught his eye when he looked around the neat room. The desk was strewn with sheets of paper and implements of writing. Isabella must have left these when Mrs Mackenzie called her to discuss some last-minute detail before the arrival of the guests. He could not imagine any other explanation for how a woman of his wife's character could leave such chaos upon her desk. He had no intention of delving into her private correspondence, but there was something peculiar about it. Perhaps the thickness of the lines, or the abundance of crossed-out words and question marks. If she paid this much attention to the wording of letters to family and friends, he thought, coming closer, she was a woman of even more meticulousness than he thought, and it was saying something. This did not look like any letter he had himself ever written, though, he realised now. For one thing, none of the names there were familiar to him. The description he found contained in a large paragraph was familiar enough, for that was one of the rooms of the Earth Castle, if one darkened by the writer's imagination. But everything else... He read the page, and then the page beneath it, his eyebrows rising throughout. When the supply of pages upon the desk was exhausted, he sat down upon the bed and lowered his head upon his hands. 
the gaiety of the evening evaporating like dew in the face of fire. Chapter 8 When Isabella first opened the door and saw the brooding tall figure of her husband standing over her desk, her thrice-blighted desk, the first thing she felt was utter terror. Her heart in her throat, she rushed forward like a mother seeking to protect her infant. This was an old fear, one from the days before her own family found her secret out. Back then, the fear was not realised. Her first manuscript did not end up in the fireplace. But back then, she was still an unmarried, relatively carefree girl. And she was dealing with people who loved her. He did not move. Indeed, far from trying to snatch the pages from her, he was holding his hands clasped behind his back. Nevertheless, Isabella looked into his eyes defiantly. Had this happened on the next day after their wedding, she might have dissolved in stuttering apologies. But she had just given him a triumph, however, a modest one. She had exerted herself on his behalf for many weeks. She closed her eyes to his indiscretions. She had very little to apologise for. I wonder... George Trevelyan started coldly. How long were you going to conceal this from me? That was enough of a spur. Perhaps not for that long, for I was doing nothing reprehensible. My writing did not impinge upon my duties. I have not neglected the keeping of our household. I have not even embarrassed our family by publishing under my own name. I have used a foreign nom de plume just as I did when still an unwed Miss Rivers. I have nothing to be reproached for. He stared at her. Published? He asked. Good heavens, it seems I know you very little indeed, my lady. That was why I did not tell you at once. I could not be sure how you would react, or rather, I had been almost sure that you were going to disapprove of this perfectly innocent pastime. It is not this pastime I disapprove of, or... Do you think I grudge you the cost of ink and paper? Do you think the expense of candles is going to undo me? No. What I dislike is the fact of your true opinions of my family. At this, she blinked. My true opinions? I'm well aware that the names were changed and the circumstances amended, but I am not the plodding mule of a fool that people take me for sometimes. The noble warlike Signor and his scheming younger brother, it was not a well-disguised imagining. Isabella was not sure whether to laugh or cry or storm out. Admittedly, this last option would have made her sleeping arrangements for the night somewhat difficult, seeing as this was her bedroom. My first novel had a villain who poisoned his first wife and then kept her portrait in the secret alcove of his castle. The heroine had to avoid becoming his second. I thank heavens you did not chance upon that manuscript, my lord. I shudder to think what you would have thought then. I know that I am not my brother, the earl continued, as if he hardly had heard. I like his charm, I like his ease, some even say I like his manners. But I assure you, you would not have wanted to be married to him instead. Much as I have loved him, even I admit that the man was a libertine. You would have had to put up with indignities of the kind no woman should have to put up with. It is not seemly to make a wife play the second fiddle to a mistress. It was these last words that pierced her painfully and twisted bloodily inside like a knife. It is peculiar that you should speak so. Isabella did her best to keep her voice carefully under control, but it still shook. Oh, it still shook. Which part? The wife playing second fiddle to another lady. I know that such things happen and happen often. I had been prepared to pretend blindness. I had been prepared to pretend genteel indifference. But for you to accuse a dead man of rakish behaviour so openly is a hypocrisy of the highest order. What do you mean? Your absences. I followed. Is that what you thought? You were mistaken. Was I? I am very sure of it. I happen to have a rather sharp memory, but even if I did not, I would have been able to tell you with all confidence that Jonathan is not my son, he is my nephew. You have a nephew? She asked, only to avoid asking who on God's green earth is Jonathan and thus reveal her ignorance. An illegitimate boy. Andrew burdened a grocer's daughter with him. 
The poor girl seemed to have been completely sure that my brother would marry her once he was back from the war, then he never came back. In darker moments, I wonder if it might not have been a peculiar mercy, given that her dreams would have been shattered in any case. Of course, I offered to take care of the boy. He shrugged his shoulders, as though asking what else could he have possibly done. I send a good sum for his upkeep every month. My lawyer and his wife had long desired children of their own, but nature was not kind to them. That was kind of you. But that is not what I meant. I meant the island on the loch. The place where you went in such great secrecy on the day I met you in the woods. At that, he was silent for a few moments. Isabella's heart sank. There it was. The confirmation she knew would come about one day, and that she dreaded nonetheless. Somehow, hearing the confession from her own husband seemed as if someone gave the foggy notion in her mind proper flesh. But when the Earl opened his mouth, these were not the words he said. Come with me, he uttered, so quickly as though he was fearing his resolve might leave him. Right now? The world was black beyond her windows. No time like the present. I will take you to that island in the middle of the loch. Then you are going to see that, although I did deceive you, it was not in the way men ordinarily deceive their wives. The new moon was still in the skies, reflecting in the dark waters of the lake like a slice of pure silver. Isabella's husband was rowing the boat as though he was doing it for the thousandth time in his life, which, Isabella corrected herself, was probably the case. The look on his face was that of sheer, grim determination. Isabella could not help but think that this looked uncomfortably similar to a tableau of wife murder in one of her novels. Admittedly, the thought elicited in her not so much fear as the yearning to capture as many details as possible in the memory so that she could use them in some future manuscript. When they only watched from the other shore, the island in the middle of the lake was silent and black like the corpse of a giant. However, as soon as Isabella stepped upon it, she heard voices from afar. A brief walk took Isabella and her husband to a small cottage. A few candles were glimmering in the windows, and now that she was close, she could see faint smoke rising from the chimney. Inside, her first impression was that of a particularly workmanlike alchemical laboratory. Admittedly, Isabella could not be sure about her comparison, since she had never seen an alchemical laboratory in person, only on engravings illustrating novels set in the Middle Ages. She was not sure, however, that the workplace of any medieval alchemist featured such a strong smell of alcohol. One of the men labouring at the vat raised his head when he saw them enter. He was very young, most certainly no older than Isabella. She thought of her own efforts at the preparation of orange wine, and how she must have looked not dissimilar to him, with her cheeks bright and the strands of her hair slightly wet from the steam. "'Is everything all right, your lordship?' The lad asked. Perfectly so, the earl nodded crisply. I have no reason to reproach you, if that is what you mean. I was only showing my wife the premises. Even through the steam, Isabella saw the apprehension on the tenant's, and who else could it have been, face. Are you sure? I mean, that is no disrespect, but her ladyship is... From south of the border, thank you, James. I am more than aware of my wife's origins, but she is a woman of loyalty and sense. I would not have had her here otherwise. James lowered his head, his expression less deferential than grudging. But if they were doing what Isabella was now almost certain they were doing, she could not fault him for being suspicious. Is it true that the gauges are upon us? Another man asked. I don't believe it, but my sister has been going on about it for days. I told her nothing to worry about. But you know how Kate is. The officers of the excise are certainly not upon us. I am sure your sister knows that. If such a thing would come to pass, I would do my best to protect my own. The Earl took Isabella outside, as her eyebrows were rising higher and higher at these remarks. Out of the heat of the cottage, the night air was especially sharp on her cheeks. Now you see, he said, looking into her eyes, I had a secret indeed but it had nothing to do with infidelity. I do see. So, how long have you been smuggling whiskey south of the border, my lord? 
she made sure to emphasise the last words. It seemed to have had its effect, for he said, I understand this is not exactly among the endeavours the man of rank and title usually engage in. Indeed, it is not. If anything, keeping a mistress on the side would have been more usual. The nerves and the shock had made her bolder in her speech. I am grateful to you for not asking a thousand questions. I do not need a thousand questions. I am aware of the Wash Act, as everyone is. Well, as every young lady who listened at the door of her father's study was, at any rate. I have heard that it made the tariffs on Highland whisky quite ruinous. It makes sense that smuggling would proliferate, but I would never have thought that a man of my position would be its perpetrator instead of its customer. Well, Isabella said, doing her best to keep her voice level and hide her disorienting feeling, it would not have made much sense for you to be the customer when it comes to local produce, would it? I mean, I mean, you live here, she ended somewhat clumsily. At first it was quite a tangle of circumstances. Upon assuming the earldom after my brother's death, I found the finances to be a cat's cradle and the war taxes made it worse. That was when it came to my attention that more than a few families among my tenants were engaging in this trade on the side. It was a small and quiet thing, and at first I nearly closed my eyes to it, for all that the Crown must have expected me to be on its side in this. Then James's older brother was press-ganged into the Navy, ran at the first opportunity, and set up a stall in his parents' cottage. So, when the rumours started, I had both the excise and the Navy men at my door. Naturally, I pretended grim ignorance and sent them away. I would have never thought you would need to pretend being grim, my lord, Isabella could not help but reply. In the first, perhaps, he admitted. The ignorance was harder. Later, I thought that, with the war showing no intention to end and the government hungry for every coin that might come its way, the measures against such people are likely to become harsher and harsher. This was when I had offered the family in question the premises to conduct their trade away from their usual haunts, close to my own residence and under my own protection. I had no intention of making anything great out of it. But it transpired that quite a number of my tenants used whisky smuggling as a convenient way to afford new ribbons for their wives. So now you are running quite an enterprise, it seems. I think you do not approve. I suppose it goes against every tenant of virtue taught once in your schoolroom. He did not say, in your schoolroom in the South, but it was implied clearly enough. The wind whistled in the dark crowns of the trees. Isabella was silent, her thoughts whirling inside her head like a flock of wild birds. Was he right? On one hand, it did indeed go against the simple notions of loyal subjects and benevolent monarchs from the lessons of her childhood. On the other hand, on the other hand, he was her husband, and no, this explanation fit her as ill as a too small shoe. It implied that she was compelled by the duty to support her husband even in his wrongdoing. When she rose from her bed this morning, she was almost sure that her husband was deceiving her that she had never had a chance to win his true affections, that his heart, or, to be more realistic, his desires, belonged to another woman. But there was no other woman. There was an attempt to help the unfortunates and save his estate from ruin, her new home, for good or ill. She remembered Thomas Darnley, the officer of the excise. Now the reason for him accepting the Earl's invitation was clear, keeping one's enemies close indeed. Decisively, Isabella raised her head and looked straight into her husband's face. I imagine your tenant's sister was not that far from the truth when she spoke of the danger. Is that why you have used a funeral cortege to conceal another consignment? He nodded. The idea was not mine. But some merchants that supply great households in the lowlands and south of the border have a rather morbid imagination. I suppose you don't. My lord, I write gothic novels. I am not easily put off by the products of morbid imagination. To say that the expression on his face radiated relief would have been to understate the case. Despite what he told James, George Trevelyan was clearly less than sure about his wife's silence, let alone her acceptance. It seems you are not going to flee from my lawless abode to the safety of your father's house then. 
With these words, he actually smiled. For a moment, his face seemed softer and younger than it ever had. He was young, Isabella realised. It was a peculiar revelation. Of course, she knew her husband's age and knew that he was less than ten years older than she, but his demeanour always made him look almost her father's contemporary. Most definitely not, under one condition. What condition? That at least in the privacy of our rooms you are going to allow me to call you by your Christian name. I will gladly grant you that. Judging by his gaze, in this particular moment, he would have gladly granted her the sickle moon from the sky. Provided you will allow me to call you by yours. Chapter 9 Isabella put the cup of hot chocolate to her lips, drank her less than dainty amount of it in one movement, and looked over the rim of the cup at her husband, the Earl of Earth. He was sitting opposite her, as always. However, some things were different. Discordant, she would have called them, had they not looked so wonderfully harmonious, as though they always were meant to be a part of their lives. For one thing, the tension in his features had eased quite considerably now, even though they had spent a sleepless night on their journey to and from the island, and their conversation afterward. For another, for another, he was now reading his correspondence the way more leisurely men read morning papers. Openly, at breakfast, without any attempt to hide the fact from their spouses. Isabella wondered if that was what marital harmony was supposed to look like. She wondered if that was what, if not happiness, then contentment truly was. With a deep sigh, George Trevelyan put the short, one-page letter away. What is the matter? Isabella ventured to ask, licking her lips. Whatever the missive contained, it could not have been good news. That much was plain. But whatever the dealings behind it, she was now to be party to it. A man in Stirling. He needs a great consignment of whisky without delay. I might be unfamiliar with the rules of commerce, but surely it is a good thing. For the estate, of course, she added, so as not to imply her husband enmeshed himself in actual trade. Even though, if she was being honest with herself, that was exactly what he did. By and large, yes. It is only that the terms of time are less than generous. Which means less time for careful preparation, I can imagine. No time for another funeral cortege. In any case, if we were to use this ploy too often, the excise men might raise their eyebrows at the exceptional mortality on my lands. Is there another? Plenty of them. George nodded. Supposed militia men and soldiers carrying vessels in their knapsacks, for instance. Would this one suit? It sounds sensible to me. With the war on, no one would look askance at a man in uniform walking the roads. Perhaps. But the amount the sterling merchant asks for would require me to equip a considerable number of these men at short notice. So the local tailors are going to bless your name in the years to come. I doubt any tailor short of a fairy tale craftsman would be able to create such a number of believable uniforms in such a time. What should we do then? It was a little foray into a foreign territory, this we. She watched her husband's face to detect a frown, or any other sign that he might resent her intrusion into his venture, but although there was a frown indeed, it was occasioned by him staring down at the letter. The same thing as we have always done, I suppose. Moonless nights, black paths, men who know the lay of the land, and a few boats upon the river Teeth. They... Have not always done that, of course. She had not done anything of the kind ever. But she appreciated this acceptance. If that is what was always done with the... How did your tenants call them? Gidges. Yes, would they not anticipate something of the kind? They might, George admitted grudgingly. But there was always a risk of discovery. I doubt it is that great. Do you genuinely doubt it, or do you merely wish to soothe me? because I don't need soothing. I want my husband uncaught and unconvicted. Isabella said the last words almost without thinking. They were what any wife with a heart in her breast was supposed to say, unless her marriage was truly horrid. But the fire in her own voice surprised her. It could not have been just about wanting to prevent being covered with shame or enmeshed in a scandal. It was not even about wanting George's approval or affection, although, God knew, she greatly desired both. 
It was about wanting him, this very man, George Trevelyan, her husband, for all his glares and glowering, to remain unharmed and by her side. As though reading her thoughts, he reached with his arm over to where her own hand lay listlessly on the table and squeezed her fingers with surprising gentleness. I will, George assured her, his voice quiet. My Isabella, I will. This is not my first time helping others to evade the excise men. This is not even my first year. I wish I could help you. You can. You already do. It is a great relief not having to skulk in the shadows away from my own wife. Isabella smiled slightly. In more ways than one, what exactly were you thinking of concealing your nephew from me? I know he had been born out of wedlock, but his father is long gone, and you have been taking care of him better than your brother would ever have done. <laughs> Did you know Andrew then? I knew men like him. I had met plenty of haughty Corinthians and young bucks during my first seasons. Few of them were cruel, but most were utterly careless. I would have been shocked to find out that any of them cared of the results of their adventures. It is still a stain on the family. My brother had ruined an honest young woman's life. Do you not agree? It is a shame on him, Isabella corrected him. Your family did not deceive the poor girl, after all, only Andrew did. If you took care of the two, it is to your credit, not your infamy. You are the lady of the house now. You could well object to my squandering a sum from our income upon the upbringing of a boy who cannot even bear the family name. I don't think that spending money on the support of a helpless child can be called squandering. A child. Isabella wondered for a moment how it might have been to hold a son, or for that matter a daughter of her own, laugh at their antics and soothe them in their little catastrophes. She gave the matter no thought before. It was simply par for the course that, upon becoming a wife, she would one day become a mother. Once did not enter into it. But now she realised that she was very much not against the notion. She was not the woman to dissolve in cooing upon seeing an image of an infant in reality or in her mind's eye, but the image was sweet. Can I see him? she asked, with a suddenness that surprised even her own self. Your nephew, I mean, if his guardians would not mind. Which was, of course, a code for if you won't mind. I don't think they would mind. I don't think they would mind at all. This time George had to slow the pace of his horse to make sure his wife always caught up to him upon her mare. The pale Eliza seemed to have taken to her red-haired rider, going as meekly as a pony. Perhaps there was something in Isabella's gentle guiding hand upon the mare's reins that always made the animal obey without realising that it did. His wife. Once the words had a leaden weight upon his mind. However, now... George repeated them almost with relish. Most likely it was due to what he had already told her at breakfast, the weight falling off his shoulders, the disappearing need to hide things from her, for her to hide things from him too. Gothic novels of all things! He was a man more given to reading Thucydides than novels. The Greeks' stark realism and recounting of debates where human lives were weighted in a balance appealed to him more than any riveting action ever could. He would have bristled had Isabella insisted on publishing the books under their name proper. Everyone knew how people looked upon noble men or noble women engaging in commerce. But that outlandish Italian nom de plume she had mentioned on their way back from the island should protect their name and honour well enough. She regarded her writing as a shameful secret, perhaps, but he was older than she and had seen more of the antics of ladies of the temps than she ever realistically could. Better a writing income than pharaoh debts, better fictional adventures than real lovers. The phrases regarded Isabella not without some apprehension. They had probably imagined a jealous matron come to inspect their boy for any stain of iniquity that marked his birth. Jonathan is a sweet child, Mrs. Fraser hurriedly assured the new Countess of Earth. I did not ever suspect otherwise. I do not have a habit of blaming children for the sins of their fathers. His wife's tone was quick and impassioned. She was always, he noticed, quite at pains to make sure others didn't think ill of her, which made her support of his smuggling venture all the more peculiar. It was some time before the child was brought forth. He was wearing a well-cut skeleton suit, 
breeches, blue waistcoat and a relaxed long jacket, and his cheeks were still bright from what must have been a thorough scrubbing from a nursemaid. The Frases were clearly eager to make sure the boy's benefactor only saw the sweet and clean and well-behaved side of him, lest he withdrew his support. Some might have called George cynical, but he had seen too much of the real world. He knew it was Thucydides who was right about human nature, and not Herodotus, his bombastic predecessor. Jonathan looked at Isabella. With the wonder in his blue eyes, Andrew's eyes, that usually mark the gaze of children seeing some unknown quality, Isabella returned the stare. So, she said, with such utter earnestness in her voice that it was obvious to George, at least, that she was not being serious at all. I think your guardians have brought you out to impress me. I can already see you are a very well-dressed young gentleman, however. I can recite you something from four dice's sermons, the boy offered with his pip squeak of a voice. If you would like, your ladyship. Four dice's sermons? Now that is a strange reading for a young boy. Did you choose that edifying read yourself? Isabella asked with an air of utter innocence. Equally serious, Jonathan shook his head. No, he replied, with all the honesty of an unsullied childhood. If one could call unsullied the life of a child whose mother had had to have him during a supposed stay on a seaside with relatives and clutch the opportunity of giving him away with both hands, Mrs. Fraser, raise it to me before I fall asleep. I can see why you do. I have always thought myself a right-thinking woman, and even I can barely bear them. Is there anything you actually like yourself? She paused evidently ransacking her memory for the impressions of her own young sibling's tastes. Cat and the fiddle? It is a very sweet rhyme. At this, the boy looked gloomy. I'm not a little baby any more, he proclaimed. I like, I like this one. He cleared his throat like a nervous performer on the stage of Drury Lane Theatre and started, Achilles' wrath to grease the direful spring of woes unnumbered heavenly goddess sing. In the corner of his eye, George could see Mrs. Fraser raise her eyebrow at her husband, who studiously looked the other way. It seemed like she was not the only one providing their charge with some educational reading. That wrath which hurled to Pluto's gloomy reign, the souls of mighty chiefs and timely slain. Jonathan soldiered on gamely, despite stumbling on the words wrath and slain, and clearly having very little understanding of what or who Pluto was. George would have never suspected his dry-as-dust lawyer to be a secret devotee of Homer. Well, of the gilded mincemeat that Alexander Pope made of Homer, at any rate. Whose limbs, unburied on the naked shore... Sweet child, that would be quite enough, Mr Fraser intervened while his wife's stare was turning into a glare. She probably did not think untimely slaughter and unburied limbs to be suitable subjects for her parlour in general, and her very young ward in particular. You didn't like it? Jonathan's cheeks were redder than before, now that they were also tinged with fading enthusiasm. Of course we did, Isabella exclaimed before anyone else could get a word in. We were just worried that you might get tired. It is a very long poem, you know. How long? Twenty-four books. Oh... It doesn't end when the priest's daughter returns to her father. Jonathan's face fell. Poor child. He was hoping for a simple and sweet happy ending. Well, Isabella stammered, there are a lot of mighty deeds and adventures afterward. It would have been a disappointingly short poem otherwise, wouldn't it? Unsure. Jonathan nodded nonetheless. Does anyone kill Agamemnon in the end? I'm afraid not. Oh, it's a shame. Young man, what a bloody-minded thing to say, Mrs Fraser exclaimed. Well, my dear, you haven't read the poem, her husband interjected. Agamemnon is a terrible brute, even by the standards of Homeric heroes. Then that lot makes an even less suitable reading for a child. Jonathan, lost, was looking back and forth at the faces of the adults. He probably understood little of the argument, but the fact that the adults around him were about to take away a great joy in his life, a place of crimson and bronze and other vibrant colours where he could retreat when the lessons became too tedious. Perhaps the Odyssey might be better, Isabella suggested hastily. I suppose it does have a few terrifying sea monsters, 
but they are hardly more terrifying than the fates of naughty children in books that make approved reading. And it ends happily, the hero making it home alive. I don't know, Mrs. Fraser murmured. Sea monsters. Sea monsters, Jonathan repeated after her in a very different tone of voice. They are not described in any great detail. Scylla is not going to haunt his sleep at night. Not like the unburied heroes of the Iliad, George could not help but think. Scylla and Cherubidus did not exist, or if they ever walked this world, they have long since left it. The churn of wars, however, continued on and on, and took away more human lives than any of the Cyclops could. Jonathan's father among them. If your ladyship recommends it, of course, Mrs. Fraser continued to sound doubtful. Naturally, she next turned to him. What do you think about it, your lordship? For a brief second, everyone in the room was looking at George. The Frasers with expectation, their ward with pleading, his wife with apprehension as though wondering if he was going to support her proposal or if his affection for her only went so far. And there was affection, George realised. Not some great passion of the kind that led to elopements or even the kind that simmered between some couples after years of marriage. But affection nonetheless and delight in watching the wind of the road tease Isabella's red hair from under her bonnet and an interest in hearing her speak. I think, he said gravely, then when it comes to the matter of books, I have reasons to defer to my wife. At this, Isabella blushed, probably recalling the discovery of her own manuscript and the revelations it led to. But George found that he rather liked watching her cheeks go brighter too. Thank you, Isabella told him when they were on horseback once more, coming back from their discreet visit. You have little to thank me for. That was true in some ways, and false in others, and Isabella knew it. They were not a couple united by love, and her dowry, though substantial, was not so opulent as to give her a great say in the lives of Earth and its master. He was under no obligation to defend her, much less defer to her in any subject. I would not have won that argument if not for you, she said. The phrases clearly look up to your opinion. I am under no illusions they do that out of anything but a respect for an employer. Besides, I am the one who pays the expenses for their ward's upbringing. Apparently, household matters are a bottomless pit when it comes to money. His frank way of speaking about it appealed to her. So many men and women of her earlier acquaintance, her own family included, danced around the questions of money, expenses and debts as though the words were a source of leprosy. She supposed one did not have the luxury to treat them like that when saddled with a spendthrift older brother from an early age and a decimated estate upon inheritance. They are indeed, Isabella noted. I believe myself to be reasonably good with household ledgers especially now that we don't have to import so many things from outside, but I still barely fit everything into a budget. It is the side of life that no one wants to think of, but... She stopped. But... Her husband raised his eyebrows. But life as we know it would have stopped without them, she ended without fire. Isabella was hopelessly distracted. Somewhere in the depths of her brain an idea was taking shape, like a strange new creature arising on one of the earlier days of creation. George, I wonder, I wonder if we might not use the fact in our enterprise. How can one use household matters in transporting large quantities of whiskey? But one can, she smiled brightly, her veins humming with exhilaration. We cannot supply people outside the highlands with whiskey, but no one would reproach you for selling or simply gifting a different produce of the estate south. Like orange wine. George caught her notion quickly, like a skilful player hitting a tennis ball. Quite so. Like orange wine sent to your old friend by the lady of the castle. You know this country much better than I do, and Isabella stumbled for a second in her self-assurance. I suppose you do have friends that you can trust, who, if asked, would vouch having received orange wine or some good homemade gin from you. I do have friends I can trust. Her husband nodded after a pause that seemed to her unnervingly long. It would be better to have some barrels of the genuine wine on top of the consignment 
in case someone would decide to be unusually thorough. I can make some. And gin, too. Isabella, when I say some, for a cargo of this size, I mean a great lot. You'll have no time. Then I am going to make some time. After all, Isabella added privately, she did not exactly bathe in the abundance of free time at home either, being the eldest daughter supposedly in need of constant instruction, correction and work to keep her idle hands from the devil. At least here, there were very few social duties, and no morning calls to make or receive, and no accomplishments to practice. The greatest accomplishments of a Highland lady seemed to be the ones that could keep her family clothed and fed and her estate prosperous, not the ones that would look pretty on a mantelpiece. Here, she could focus on the things that truly mattered. Chapter 10 His wife's cheeks were burning red, and her breath was heavy. Which was no surprise, given that she was mixing her ingredients in a lidded jar. The sticky aroma of sugar in the air was mixing with a sharp tang of simple spirits, leaving little of the recipe to imagination. You should have asked someone to help you with this, George told Isabella, coming into the still room. Even my mother, industrious though she was, did not try to do everything herself. Perhaps not, she replied, stopping her work for a second. But I imagine your lady mother did not have to participate in ventures such as this one. And nor did her husband's freedom depend on the efficacy of her gin-making. Do you regret involving yourself in all of this? Strangely enough, not at all. Call me an immature half-child, if you will, but there is something peculiarly thrilling about this plan. I would never have taken you for a budding adventurous. Perhaps it was the spirits in the air. Or perhaps it was the fact that his wife's sleeves were rolled up to her elbows, bearing most of her arms as though she were a dairymaid at work. Plenty of men, Andrew included, would have scorned the sight, preferring their ladies dainty and polished. George was a man of practical and solid tastes, and preferred his everything wholesome and industrious. Oh, I would have never suspected myself of such tendencies either, Isabella replied brightly. I have always thought myself the voice of steady reason, at least among my siblings. I thought to remain so until my dying day. But remaining the voice of steady reason in this case would have meant dissuading you from your folly, or at the very least refusing to take part with it and... And? George prompted her, stepping close. She was lovely and hardy, with her bare arms and bright cheeks. She had always been hardy, he realised. Even in the very beginning when she agreed to come north to marry him without a shade of complaint visible on her pale, stoic face, even before that, as a child, when she took upon herself to comfort her brother and sister and prepare them for the news that the grown-ups did not think it right to impart to them at first. Suddenly, he felt a great urge to come even closer, to kiss those flushed cheeks of hers, then part her hands from the unceasing task and cover her fingers with the touches of his lips too. The world swayed on its axis, very slightly, but noticeably. The only time George had experienced anything like this before was during the awkward, clumsy times Andrew tried to initiate himself into dissipation, or else just to see how many glasses of port did it take to fell his younger brother and involve him into some embarrassment. Those times, the loss of steady control over himself was terrifying. Now... It was only marginally less so. He did make another step towards his wife, and then his gaze fell upon half-crushed red berries in the jar. What are these? George did his best to keep a sudden panic from his voice. Slow berries. I have heard they make for a marvellous gin flavour. Isabella, don't tell me you had gathered them yourself. Who else would have done it for me, given the secrecy of our matter? Secrecy or no secrecy? You do know the thorns of the blackthorn tree can be poisonous. Mortally? No, only mildly, he admitted. But there can be swelling and pains and... God, Isabella, is secrecy or no secrecy? You should have entrusted this one to someone who has years of experience in dealing with the flora. Someone who knows how to avoid being bitten by nature's teeth. But I have not been bitten, have I? Isabella stopped her work and showed him her bare hands. Their skin flushed but clean and clear. She smiled almost victoriously. See, George? Not a single thorn prick. 
George stared down upon her hands, presented to him as though for inspection. He had seen them many times, of course, smooth and hidden in kid gloves, or bare in the confines of their home, but never so brazenly up close. He noticed how long her fingers were. He noticed, too, that their skin was stained with ink. How did he not notice this detail before? He should have found his wife's innocent secret much earlier. Perhaps he had simply told himself back then that Isabella must be an avid letter writer. But, in truth, the truth he had to admit to himself now, he simply did not care enough. He cared now. George took her hands in his own and squeezed them, perhaps too strongly for her breath caught for a moment. He hurriedly relaxed his grasp. Could he do nothing right? Not even the things most men understood by instinct. Would you forbid me to do such things again? Isabella asked. I was simply worried about the safety of our plan. No, I would ask you to be careful. I don't want to lose my wife. You would not have lost me. It would have simply hurt a little bit for a while. I don't want my wife to hurt either. For a second she looked almost sullen. But then her expression mellowed, and a faint smile shadowed the corners of his wife's lips. And George Trevelyan, and the Earl of Eth realised that perhaps he could do something right after all. The news came at the most unlikely time. Isabella did not quite get used to the peculiarities of the local Sunday sermons in all the months she had spent as the new Countess of Earth. The preaching itself was not outlandish in the least, but the crowd that gathered in the pews certainly was. For one thing, not a single young lady wore a bonnet or any other manner of complete head covering. Instead, the local girls plaited their hair behind in the way Isabella was more used to seeing upon the busts of unnamed but presumably virtuous Grecian ladies. Except she was not sure the girls of old Athens ever washed their hair in so concentrated a decoction of the young buds of the birch trees. The scent permeating the kirk as a result was not unpleasant in the least, but it was as strong as any perfume. Then there were the gowns the unmarried Highland women wore. Homespun, yes, but bright. Among the daughters of local tradesmen and wealthier farmers, these were often enlivened by a string of amber, glittering like solid golden fire against the white of their exposed throats. It was a wonder, Isabella could not help but think, that the local young man could keep any sort of focus on the lofty heights of salvation and charity during the Sunday service. She was in the middle of the thought when she felt a warm breath against the skin of her ear and shuddered involuntarily. Her mind immediately went to the slimy fixation in Thomas Darnley's eyes when he regarded her first. But the voice she heard next was unfamiliar to her. It all went through your leadership. Just got the news in the morning. Isabella's first instinct was to turn around, but she realised that would defeat the entire effort at secrecy. Therefore, she forced herself to incline her head in such a way that the man sitting behind her, likely one of the tenants of good station, saw the approving nod. She tried to make it quiet and dignified, but in truth her heart was hammering with excitement. Isabella did not tell her husband as much, but her hands and arms still hurt from the intense work she had to perform in order to brew the cover for their consignment. An elation flooded her soul. An elation at a job well done that before she had only known after the completion of a particularly difficult scene in a manuscript. As soon as the service was over and they returned to the relative privacy of the castle, Isabella clasped her husband's hands with exuberance. Have you heard it too? We... Yes, we have accomplished what we set out to do. As usual, George Trebellion did not make a fuss. He was, however, smiling, and accomplishing that miracle was a feat in itself. We have quite a chain of beacons in the men who pass the news on. I only worry that one day a whisper misplaced might find its way into a wrong ear. Looking at the brighter side of life as always, I see, Isabella laughed. This is the brightest I can ever grow, I am afraid. We shall test that proposition in the future. By heavens, you are glowing. As well you might, of course, we would not have done so without your help. Hardly, Isabella demurred. Not so much out of conscious decision, 
as out of habit that came to her as easily as breathing. I merely helped, and I imagine your men are very knowledgeable. Isabella, I am not the man to compliment others with false gold. I said that we could not have succeeded without your help, and I mean it. If you are sure. I am sure, her husband replied firmly. In that case, could we celebrate our success, privately, that is, she added quickly, seeing how his expression changed at the notion of another great gathering. We could accept the invitation to one of the hunt balls in the vicinity. There should be plenty of them, now that it is autumn. I have heard the Highland game is better than anything in the South, and I imagine people here like celebrating the fact no less than those I had known at home. The red deer is magnificent, George told her, not without a hint of pride. Well then, I imagine the grants of Rothimashus would love to celebrate the fact. We could celebrate our own good hunting, a much more important kind, without anyone the wiser. Chapter 11 Isabella could not help but agree with her husband about the grant's great hospitality. It was not enough for them to provide a modest block of chalk just before the entrance to the ballroom. No, the whole grand floor was covered with this fine fair substance to prevent the smooth leather soles of the men from slipping during especially vigorous dances. It was peculiar almost to wear a ball gown again after a seeming eternity that separated her first and last season from this day. The gown was from home, a pale satin thing that made her red hair bright as fire against the modest hue of the cloth. It was cut to a formal pattern, a Grecian thing that would have gained the fashionable Mr. Hope's approval had he been there to see it. The yellow slippers on Isabella's feet, however, had been crafted in Perth. The musicians started a lively tune, which Isabella did not know, and she quietly inquired about it, looking at her husband. This is Sean Trues, a rather fast dance. Would you like to try it? He visibly steeled himself against the prospect of hopping and skipping. Isabella shook her head. Even if I did, I have not the slightest notion of the steps. It seems I would have to find myself a dancing master once more, as though the days of my girlhood had come again. I wonder if you have ever had actual days of girlhood. I assure you I have lived long years unmarried. Naturally. But it was hardly the carefree childhood of the sweet engravings, was it? No one's really is. I imagine your sister's is. Perhaps your brother's too. What are you trying to tell me? Merely that I had never met a woman, or for that matter a man, wound as tightly as you, dear wife. If you were a clockwork mechanism, you would have shown time with exquisite precision. But you are made of flesh and bone. That is quite a revelation coming from you. Did your own youth not mostly concern unjust responsibilities? It did. The Earl nodded, which is why you would do well to believe me. If I think that one is killing oneself with duty, the case is likely grievous. What do you propose I do now in the middle of a ball? Dance, Isabella. You have new slippers to wear out. I have always been an indifferent dancer, she confessed. So have I. So charging you with unpractised skill would have been a hypocrisy of the highest sort on my part. Other gentlemen here might take a less lenient view of my habit of toe-treading. The night, he paused, I can dance with you, and spare you the need to find those lenient gentlemen. Just not the Sean Trues, she hazarded a guess. Not the Sean Trues, George admitted, but I promise you the next dance after that. If I know the hosts well, it is likely to be something more sedate. They've always been considerate of their guests. Isabella parted her lips to reply when she heard a soft tread of footsteps behind her. That was nothing significant in its own right. They were in a ballroom, not in a primeval forest, and there were dozens of pairs of feet gliding and skipping and simply walking their way across the well-chalked floor at the moment. But there was something sinister in their quietude. Lord Earth. Thomas Darnley's voice said so closely to her that Isabella almost jumped would you mind if I speak to your wife for a few minutes? We had not met since the day of your charming supper, and I had despaired to see her ladyship again. The other's expression grew grim, and Isabella felt certain he was going to refuse the gauger outright. 
She gave her husband a barely noticeable sign, shaking her head a little. Such a refusal would be rightly perceived by Thomas Darnley as a stark insult by Thomas Darnley and everyone around them at the moment, which, given they were in the ballroom of one of the most notable castles in the vicinity, was quite a number of people. It never paid to be discourteous, especially in public, if only because it never paid to give one's enemies new weapons against you. Naturally, George said instead with frank curtness. Darnley inclined his head, as though he did not notice his tone. Thank you, your lordship. I promised to return her ladyship to you, safe and sound. There was nothing he could do to her in the middle of a great gathering, of a ballroom where every shadow had been banished by golden candlelight, Isabella told herself. On such nights of gaiety, even the gloomier memories that any old castle possessed retreated. And yet, as she took a turn around the room with the man she knew now to be her enemy, she could not suppress a cold ripple running across her skin. I have to apologise for my words, Darnley told her suddenly. I understand how my judgment of your husband has been too harsh. Isabella was not fool enough to accept this at face value. She knew that it must have been a mere prelude to some verbal blow. But there was nothing she could do about the fact until the blow came. If politeness was a weapon, it could also be turned into shackles. I accept your apologies, Mr. Darnley. I understand that gentlemen who are somewhat in their cups often say things they never would otherwise. An annoyance flashed across his expression. He had been sober as a looking-glass that evening, and being implied to have behaved as a drunken oaf would please no man. Nevertheless, he continued, his tone as smooth and level as before. That is true. I know now that his lordship is a most admirable man. He takes great care of the commonwealth of his tenants, does he not? Of course he does, Isabella replied crisply. Which should be an example to every landowner in the land. Or it should have been. If only. If only what? If only not for the rumours that at times his zeal is excessive. Is there such a thing as a too zealous care about one's estate? We are at war, your ladyship. Thank you dearly, Mr. Darnley. I have noticed it. I do wonder how our men are going to defeat the French if they cannot be sure of the loyalty of those left at home. Is it on behalf of soldiers and sailors that you are threatening me, Mr. Darnley? I am sure they are grateful to you. I am not threatening you, your ladyship. I am only telling you that His Majesty's government is taking a less and less favourable view of those who try to circumvent their laws. Some things that might have been let through in the seventies are looked at askance now. In that case, you can assure His Majesty's Government that the Earl of Earth is a loyal subject and wishes them hearty victories against France. While you are holding that conversation, remind them also that his own brother died fighting their enemies. So he did, and cleared his lordship's path to earldom. I imagine that would have salvaged your husband's wounds somewhat. You do not understand my husband, Isabella thought. He never could and never will. No doubt he would have been gleeful in his place, a title as a shining prize, an Elysium without responsibilities, the way it had been for his brother. Your imagination seems to be very good, Mr. Darnley, Isabella replied coldly. I do hope you will excuse me now. The new dance is starting and I had promised my husband this one. The waltz? I would have never thought his lordship to be such a lover of new fashions, especially such bold ones. But of course, you know him better than I, otherwise you would not have been professing his innocence so avidly. A sickly feeling burning her stomach, Isabella's first thought was to sit down and wait this dance, and possibly several other ones, out, where the old chaperons were huddling. But then her pride reared its head. She would not let this officer with his cold eyes know how he had disconcerted her. She knew enough about nature to remember that when predators feel the scent of fear, it rarely ends well for the prey. Instead, she went back to her husband and smiled at him with an effort. He hesitated. I have to say, waltz is an obscure territory for me. In the corner of her eye, Isabella saw the couples gliding across the floor, the gentleman clutching the ladies as though in close embraces. She could see why her taciturn husband thought little of it. 
She could also see why she herself had never been permitted to try it, even when it emerged in the year of her first season. I had seen it danced, she said, but I had never tried it myself. I suppose we are well matched once again, then. I promise not to maim your toes. I promise not to let you fall. With these words, George Trevelyan, the Earl of Earth, led his wife across the floor, pale with a faint layer of chalk, and put one hand upon her waist. She felt curiously warm at the touch. For some reason, a thought came into her head of that wedding night that never was, and a wondering about how it might have felt. Then he clasped her hand in his, with unpractised and curious gentleness, and made the first step. He was right. His knowledge of the dance was little, and his steps unpractised. But so, as Isabella had rightly confessed, were hers. She was quite sure that the more fashionable ladies among the guests were probably restraining their giggles at the sight that she presented to them, that they both presented to them. After all, they looked like what they were. A clumsy married couple, not so much whirling in a flow of satin as stumbling around haltingly. Isabella did not talk to her husband at first, and he prompted no conversation. Instead, they were wholly consumed by the muted exploration that the long dance was, as though discovering that the way the muscles and sinews beneath the other's skin moved, and learning to mould one's own steps to that movement. Several minutes passed, the minutes that to Isabella seemed to be stretching into eternity before George broke the silence with a simple question. What did that creature want from you? Mr. Darnley, it was like waking up from a trance. There is no other person in this ballroom I would term a creature. Nothing much. Simple insinuations about his knowledge of your guilt. He was merely trying to frighten me. Did he succeed? At first, Isabella squeezed her hand slightly around her husband's, a private gesture unseen in the bright whirl of the dancers. But that success has dissipated now. He still has to pay. You are my wife, and I will allow no one to treat you this way. Even if he has, there is no great opportunity for us to make it so, Isabella reasoned. He has been appointed by His Majesty's government. What exactly can we do to him? Cease inviting him to social occasions? I can do that, but I suspect that is not what you mean. You are pragmatic, as always. There is no need for worry. Our plan has worked, has it not? She lowered her voice. You had told me that we expect no other orders of such ambition any time soon. Perhaps you are not wrong, George said grudgingly. But it is no great feat to expect things to go badly, when in one's experience they usually do. Isabella was writing at the desk in her bedroom when she heard footsteps outside the door, and then the polite knock. She knew who was there without needing to ask. She could guess at the purpose of his visit, too. Except it felt forced and unnecessary to term it so now. Isabella did not want to admit her husband to her room by merely calling out for him to come in. Instead, she rose from the desk, this time making no gesture to conceal her writing. Her work was swiftly reaching its hopefully riveting enough conclusion, but there was still quite a lot left to be done. She opened the door, and saw that George, standing on the threshold, looked pale and unsure, as though a young lad before his first kiss. There was not a trace of gritted teeth determination that coloured his every dealing, or at least had coloured his every dealing once. Isabella was not the person to gloat, even inwardly over the discomfort of others, even if those were in some way her opponents, which her husband had ceased to be months ago. She took his hand and squeezed it, as she had done during the waltz. George closed the door behind him with the other hand as he stepped in, ever the habit for neatness. Then he clutched Isabella close and kissed her on her lips. If he had had little practice, she had none. It was a thing as clumsy as their dance, but one even more thrilling. She wrapped her arms around his neck and delighted in the heat of his mouth. George kissed her by the ear next and Isabella shivered sweetly at the touch. She had not known how sensitive that patch of skin was. She pressed closer to her husband when she heard another knock on the door. God almighty, George murmured, 
stepping away from her with the expression of the greatest reluctance. This is just the magnitude of my luck. It might be the maid come to prepare me for bed, Isabella ventured. Somewhat hopeful, still breathless, I will just tell her that... But he was already opening the door and revealing the fact that the woman standing on the threshold of Isabella's bedroom was not a maid. Your lordship, there is someone to see you, Mrs Mackenzie said, her usually placid eyes aglow in an expression of almost wilderness. He says it's urgent. I've barely found you. Someone to see me at this hour? He says something about, uh, let me remember, she whispered the last word, gaugers. The housekeeper had barely finished talking, when George was already striding past her with the utmost speed. Isabella set out after him when the housekeeper raised her hand soothingly. With all due respect, your ladyship, this looks like a matter for your husband to resolve. He might need my help. Your ladyship, he has been dealing with the problems of earth for years. And I will likely have to deal with them for years to come. I might as well start now. There are things you do not need to involve yourself in. I already have. I know about the smuggling, Mrs Mackenzie. The urgency in the older woman's eyes deepened into panic. I was the one who helped his lordship with his last consignment, Isabella added to calm it down. I know what is at stake. I, I don't know. But I suspect you have been trying to keep me from exploring the other parts of the estate, lest I stumble upon the island and its secret, have you not? God forgive me, but I have. I would have never harmed you, your ladyship. You have to believe me. I merely hoped you would be... Content as it was. I have known his lordship since he was a child, since he and his poor brother were playing outlaws in those woods. Is that when he had discovered the hovel on the island? I imagine it made a splendid hideout for Robin Hood and his merry men. Mrs. Mackenzie nodded. Yes. Although there on the shore, his lordship was more often the fisher king of all those Arthurian tales, with his brother the victorious Parzival. With these words, she stepped aside and let Isabella pass down the corridor unimpeded. The Fisher King was the guardian of his lands, she recalled, but the soil of the land was also his flesh, and when he was wounded and his wound bled, his kingdom was rendered barren. By the time she arrived in the drawing room, James was already finishing his tale. I've been sent here to tell you, your lordship, Brother says I've got the fastest legs, but I'd rather I had stronger arms. What happened? Isabella asked, her heart beating fast, her head light, as though she was sick with fever. The excise men. George turned to her. They had traced one of my tenants to the loch, then to the island. His eyes were as storm clouds. They are tearing the place apart, tearing my men apart. I need to go at once. Yourself? But, but that would only confirm your guilt in their eyes and... Isabella. He took her by the shoulders, his hands careful but firm. There is no course of action that would make them disbelieve my guilt now. Please. I have promised these people my protection. What value would there be in my words if I abandoned my duty now? Please. James's tone was not different from Isabella's own. My brother was trying to hold them off, but... That seemed to have sealed George's decision. Nodding curtly, he said, I will ride at once. Me and my hunting rifle. Chapter 12 There was smoke rising from the island, but not the smoke of discreet industry, not any more. This time it was the smoke of destruction, dark coils of it reaching the deceptively placid mirror of the lake water. George Trevelyan, the Earl of Earth, smelled the burning before he saw the wanton red flames engulfing the cottage, the burning and the sharp smell of spilled alcohol. Fools! Utter fools! Who on earth sets a fire a place half full of whiskey? The flames were almost beautiful, in a wild and devouring manner, the tongues of living gold and red eating through the things of human work. For the first and last time, George regretted he did not take his wife here alongside him. She would have found the sight worthy of a dozen notes, and probably a scene of great vividness. The ground was covered with shards of glass, some great and cruel, some small as the stars in the sky, 
They were reflecting the burning pandemonium around them, a myriad of unwilling mirrors. The pandemonium, both natural and human, for a dozen men he did not know were fighting the five he did. A dozen men he did not know and one he had seen too many times. Mr. Dunley, George called out, you are on my lands. These are my tenants under my protection. Tell your men to step back. The fire was reflecting in amber gold in Thomas Darnley's pale eyes, colouring them bright for the first time George had ever seen. His face was, in turn, almost cheerfully florid from the heat. The heat of the flames or the heat of the fight? Whichever it was, it was clear that the officer of the excise had never felt more alive than he did in that moment. These are men who broke the law, he said, and in a rather grand way, don't you think, your lordship? These... Darnley nodded at the wreckage of the operations. We're not the smart skills I'm used to uncovering in these parts. They harmed no one. Of course they did. You did. We're at war, or have you not noticed? Though I bet you did. That's how you got your title after all. I wonder who it was that filled your older brother's head with promises of glory. His tenants were armed with cudgels. Darnley's underlings armed with the same. It was like one of the sordid, squalid fights in the days before the rebellion, when men bludgeoned each other over cattle. But the officer himself must have been carrying a pistol, for in the corner of his eye George could see James's older brother on the ground, clutching his bleeding hip, curled up as though he had retreated through all the ages of man to a helpless infancy. You are a stupid and spiteful man if you think my brother needed that. George did his best to keep his voice level, to do what he had always done, to preserve the calm and the order, and the... Except there was no calm and order here. There could not be. He was staring at the face of his nightmare, and his nightmare was mocking him. He clutched his rifle. Try it, Darnley called out, raising his own gun. My death would bring an army on your doorstep. For a second, George was horribly close to claiming that he cared not for that. He needed to do what he could to rid his lands of a pest and an enemy. He needed to shield the people under his protection. He alone stood against the danger, as it had always been, and... Except Isabella was also under his protection now. What was going to happen to her, with her husband enmeshed in a great and scandalous crime? Suddenly he saw a flash of red among the trees. The fire spreading? That would have been preferable to his second thought. Then George saw the flash again, and his blood froze in his veins. It was, indeed, his wife, the lithe figure darting through the backstage of the scene of destruction, her hair uncovered and braided hastily as though she were an unmarried Highland girl at a Sunday service. How did she get here so fast? Forget that. How did she get here at all? Didn't she understand the danger? He wanted to call out to her, to tell her to run. But he was not a fool. He knew that such a gesture would only attract the other's attention to her, and the thought of Thomas Darnley, or anyone, clutching Isabella in a vicious grip was too much to bear. While George was silent, she was safe. Surrounded by striding fighters, people rarely paid any attention to someone slender and small. George knew that well, if not in quite so literal a sense. An idea had not dawned upon him, but an inkling of it darkened his thoughts. He wondered, for a second, if that was how his wife felt when getting a notion of a new novel. George made quick eye contact with her, then a barely perceptible gesture with his head, a gesture toward where James's brother lay crouched. It did not take long, but he saw Darnley's gaze grow suspicious, saw his head turning to where he saw George himself look. He needed to distract him and fast. How did you find this place? George called out. Gentlemen walkers can be bearers of much wonderful information. Aren't they often taken for enemy spies? Only in the vicinity of the coast. Here in the depths of highlands there is precious little they could have done to help the French, even if they wanted to. Plenty to do to help their own country, though. The gauger was gloating like an adolescent. If not for the tragedy unfolding all around him, if not for the man he knew breathing his last... George would have thought it akin to watching a play with a bad actor who thought himself the new Kemble. 
God, but that was excruciating. Simply standing and talking and surrendering the nerve of action to someone else. All his life, it had been him, George Trevelyan, who acted, who worked and arranged and protected. But there was no other way now. But the bareheaded, flame-haired figure was softly approaching the place where James's brother was bleeding his life out into the soil that his parents tilled. Where the cudgel had fallen out of his hand was lying in the shadow of his contorted body. We might come to a settlement, George said in an attempt to distract the officer. Tell your men to leave mine alone, and I will forget about your intrusion upon my lands. Nay, intrusion, Darnley exclaimed. You're forgetting something, your lordship. This is not your fiefdom any more, and you're no longer a chief apt to raid cattle from the neighbour whenever he wants. George had never been a chief of a clan in the first place, but although in any other circumstances his pedantical bent would have definitely driven him to correct his enemy, right now his whole mind and thoughts were consumed by the alert expectation the expectation of what his wife was going to do if she was going to do it. He saw Isabella pick the cudgel up carefully. He even saw her usually already pale hands whiten, gloveless as they were, under the strain of carrying the heavy thing. You are the subject of his majesty now, Darnley continued, oblivious. If your pride and your avarice are going to cost us a war, you... Something must have betrayed him. A leaning of his head a fraction too far, a gaze too eager, perhaps. The fact was Darnley inhaled sharply upon noticing it, and then he turned. The gun was now in his hand. Without a thought, without even rational notion of what he was about to do, George sprang forth, using the moment of distraction to tackle his foe to the ground. The gun went off. At first, George felt nothing at all. Then... A sharp and crimson pain blossomed upon his hip, and black stains swum in front of his eyes. He heard two screams. Both were brief. Darnley's was brief because he lost consciousness when Isabella finally brought the cudgel upon his head. Her own scream was short, because she was not the woman given to prolonged panic. Her gaze was drawn by something on the ground, something small and slick with red. Thank heavens! she breathed. The bullet has passed through. Without a trace of timidity, she took the bullet, warm still with her husband's blood, in her hands, and the gore reddened her fingertips. Now George knew what he had to do, had no choice but to do, because even if he was bleeding and limping and his wife was hale and hearty, he knew the men here were going to listen to him, not to his lady. Your officer needs help, he raised his voice coldly. The gauger's henchmen stopped, one by one. Is it breathing? One of them demanded to know, glaring at George with a bare-faced viciousness. Perfectly so. I laid no hand upon him. Do you think us fools, your lordship? Another asked. I can swear upon my good name and upon my blood, which is very convenient given that there is quite a lot of the latter right now. There were some exchanges of nervous glances. For all of their officers' bravado, it was one thing to beat helpless tenant farmers to a pulp. It was another to come in just within an inch of murdering an earl. This is not going to let these men go unpunished, one of the henchmen threatened. We still know what we saw. I know what I saw too. Look at this place. This part of the forest is growing up on my land. Or rather, it was growing here before you oafs came. Since we're... Talking about pressing charges, I am curious as to what the courts are going to say to this. They value the notion of property. The pain pulsing under his skin robbed him of the faculty to think for a moment. Exceedingly, George finally said. No man or woman on earth, he suspected, liked it when their own greed was turned against them. If one thought that unpaid taxes and circumvented tariffs were a matter worth spilling the blood of living men over... They could hardly complain when others claimed that valuable timber was about as high in estimation. That is, George had no doubt that complain they will, but the world was slowly reasserting itself now, just as the fire was dying down into ash. The world where he had at least some control over the domain of his life and an ability to render help to those of the others. Even though now he was to share the domain with a queen consort. 
I assure you. I am perfectly healthy, George grumbled. You do still look pale when you walk for a long time, Isabella parried, crossing the drawing room. I can walk for a long time, however. Riding should be easier for me. I would rather you did not lose consciousness in the middle of the moors. You and Mr. Fraser both seem to see me as a tender flower on the verge of extinction. I suspect in Mr. Fraser's case it is merely a professional attitude. That explained it partly, of course. George supposed that any lawyer worth his salt would press the client to compose an ironclad will after an injury of this nature. But he also strongly suspected that the lion's share of Mr. Fraser's interest was caused by something else entirely. The lawyer had probably feared that, should anything happen to his client, little Jonathan would remain without a benefactor unless a will is going to protect his interests. In fact, it was the Fraser's home that he wanted to visit today. It seemed, however, that his novelist wife noticed every change of hue in his complexion and every crease across his brow, and she would not be satisfied until he was healthy as Achilles. Before the whole business with the arrow, of course. How are the works going? he asked instead. Quite well. At this, Isabella brightened. Those stills are quite difficult to construct, as far as I understood, and cause a number of workers some unease about building them out, essentially in the castle gardens, but... It is not far from the still room you had used for orange wine brewing, is it not? I'm using, Isabella corrected him, not without a little self-satisfaction. Now that the Brothers' Curse is in the process of being fitted to print, I have more than enough free time to fill our cellars. For both of them, the night of the confrontation on the island was still a lacuna of silence, something they wanted to circle with the greatest care. George remembered his moment of blind terror when she saw Darnley turn around to see Isabella too well. He suspected that, for his wife, the second when she saw her husband hit by a bullet, played the same role. However, it was not without some satisfaction that George learned that his old enemy was quietly discharged from the excise on account of his overreaching. Isabella bristled at the news and proclaimed that, had she been the author of that man's life, she would have given him a grislier comeuppance, if only to satisfy the readers. In George's opinion, it was a comeuppance enough. He strongly suspected that, with the war on and showing no intention of ending soon, Darnley's zeal would soon be found a more immediate application. George had heard tales of the life in the Navy from James's older brother, now walking with a cane. He did not precisely pity his enemy as a result, but he was brought perilously close to it. My capable wife, George said, and took Isabella's hand, pressing the palm against his lips. She blushed and ran the fingers of her other hand through his hair. He might not have been well enough to ride, at least in her opinion. However, it was clear she considered him more than well enough for kissing. She was soon sitting by his side, his arms around her waist, her head turned and her mouth pressed against his when George leaned back for a second and touched her lips with his finger. I do believe, my dear, that we have been interrupted at something rather important. She blinked, without understanding at first, clearly thinking that his words referred to some recent business, her busy mind shifting through the sands of time. Then she smiled. She understood what he meant. He might not have been well enough to ride yet, but he was well enough to mount the long, winding stairs to his wife's bedchamber. Epilogue Isabella was sitting in the garden, looking at the two miscreants who were standing in front of her. Well, she inquired mildly, her hands upon her knees in a false appearance of placidity, I do wonder what you have to say in your defence. It was my fault, Jonathan exclaimed, without waiting for Richard's raising his own voice. I suggested we play in the woods. I am not a baby, the five-year-old Richard, he with the hair of his father's hue and his eyes of his mother's grey, contradicted him. It's not as though it forced me. He turned to his mother. I'm sorry. I just thought nobody will. We thought we'd only be gone for an hour and no one would miss us. What a mother you must think me to be. 
that you think I would not notice my child and his cousin vanishing into the forest for an hour or more. Did you not think how frightened me and your father were going to be when we saw your disappearance? Although Richard was not a redhead, he did peculiarly inherit her propensity for blushing. Right now, his cheeks, still not free from the puppy fat, were burning red. She noticed Jonathan squeezing his hand like an inmate in some dungeon trying to comfort his timid cellmate. She did her very best not to laugh. That would have rather ruined her point. She just knew that leaving these two boys alone to play games of their own devising was a bad idea. Jonathan had only arrived to spend his holidays at Castle Earth a week ago, and this is what happened. Isabella was touched by his willingness to defend his cousin, however. She was saddened for a moment about the fact that, whatever occupation and match awaited the older boy in the future, they would likely take him far away from these moors. Moreover, Isabella prepared to deliver the coup de grace. Little Arabella cried when she could not find you two. At this, Richard's shoulders sagged. He could bear a dozen lectures on abstract virtues with a stoic glazed gaze, the possibility of having upset or hurt someone dear to him with his conduct, especially his little sister, however, awakened his sense of responsibility better than any dozen shapeless moral notions would have. May I ask, what is this all about? George came to stand beside his wife. Judging by his riding boots, he had recently come from the stables. These little outlaws were plying their trade in the forest and forgot to even tell anyone, much less ask permission, Isabella explained. George took one look at the unlucky pair, taking in their expressions and their burning faces. I suppose that is the sort of crime easily remedied, he declared. Jonathan, by this time tomorrow, you should read the first three chapters of Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War and be prepared to answer any questions. Believe me, I can be a harsh examiner. Richard, well, I suppose you are too young for that. Aesop's fables for you. I am not assigning either of you Homer, because a punishment is not really supposed to be a delight. Mrs. Mackenzie is going to show you the tomes in the library. After a few contrite nods, the boys started through the garden path toward the house. The trees were suffused with a Byzantine golden glow of the early twilight. The weather this summer was not particularly clement, but the beauties of nature were not diminished for that. Quite a pair they are, George commented, gazing at his son and nephew's backs. I tremble for earth when these two grow up. Perhaps his sister will be the steadying influence, Isabella suggested. Not all sisters are like you, my dear. Our little one is still very young, of course, but dignity and reticence are not exactly the first words that come to mind when making her acquaintance. She is a child, Isabella shrugged. I had once known a child who had to learn dignity and reticence from an early age. Indeed, I had often glimpsed that girl in a mirror. It had brought her a little bit suffering. When the children were safely around the bend of the garden path, George leaned toward her and planted a quick kiss upon his wife's lips. They might be watching through the bush, Isabella laughed. I hope not. So do I. After all, when I had been their age, adults expressing such affection seemed to me a strange and displeasing thing. I dearly hope you have changed that opinion since then. Well, Isabella smiled. With my husband's help, I certainly have. This is Mary Jane Wells. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of A Novelist and an Earl by Anne Hawthorne. Presented by Anne Hawthorne. Text copyright 2023 by Anne Hawthorne. Production copyright 2023 by Anne Hawthorne. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening.